I'm not a ranger, but I do have a story about the woods out behind my house. I've only ever lived one place in my whole life. I lived with my family up on a mountain in rural Alabama. Like, really rural. Around our house you could walk two or three miles in any direction and not find any sign of civilization except for the road leading up to our house. Just trees, leaves, and pine straw. So just a three mile radius of private woodland. Anyway one night when I was probably about 15 or 16, I had a lady friend at my house who I desperately wanted to impress. So I decided it would be cool to go walk out to my favorite spot in the woods. In hindsight I know I shouldn't have done it but the spot was my ace in the whole light it was super romantic. Fireflies and the sound of a small stream the whole shebang. She seemed tentative at first because she was smart but ultimately caved to the thought of adventure. So we start walking down the path I had cut out. I've got my lantern because I couldn't find the flashlight so I couldn't really see too far out in front of me but it was enough to see the path. So it's about a 10 or 15 minute walk and about halfway through there was this kind of distant weird buzzing sound. It was hardly loud enough to interrupt our talking but it was definitely there whenever there was a break in talking. At first I really didn't think much of it. The woods can be a really loud place at night with all the bugs and it was getting to be spring. So I pretty much ignored it. Then after a bit of walking it was definitely getting to be more and more pronounced. Eventually my friend asked me if I heard it too and after I confirmed it she was adamant about turning around and just going back. I agreed just to make her comfortable but as we were going back the noise just kept getting louder, and eventually as we were almost back it was clear what the noise was. The sound of someone playing a harmonica had been gaining on us in the dark the whole way. By the end of it we were running pretty much full speed out of the woods across the yard and straight into the house. We went up to one of the windows facing the yard hit the light and cracked the windowsill to listen. It was still out there, playing its harmonica. And we listened to it pass the house and fade into the pines. By far the most surreal, horrifying experience of my life. Probably my most cherished memory too because that girl ended up being the one that got away. Fall of 2017 I shot a deer right around dark about 5 miles out of my truck. I go back, get my gear off and grab my cart. I get to my deer, gut it quick and head out. Well about 2 miles in, my deer cart breaks. The wool snapped clean off. I had to sling on my back. About that time I heard some coyotes, I'd say 3 or 4, faintly on the gut pile. I go another mile before I take a break. I'm chilling there, listening to the yotes when it hits me like a hard tap on the nuts, they were much louder and many more yips than earlier. Within a quarter mile. And here I am sitting like a waffle with no weapon but a hatchet and gut knife sitting next to the second course of their feast. Now, of course, the first three miles from my stand consists of fairly easy walking. Dry, some thick spots but overall a easy walk. But the last two. Swampy is all hell and thicker than. I picked up, zigzagging through the swamp, running on adrenaline, not looking back as the easily dozen coyotes were about a 100 feet away. I never once stopped and never once looked back. On the home stretch I hopped the five foot gate with the deer on my back like it was nothing. Though I collapsed on the other side, nearly passing out. I heard the coyotes hit the fence within 10 seconds of my jump. They howled and snarled and screamed at me, who was clinching the knife ready to meet my maker, from the other side, and then just like that they were gone. The woods were silent and I hobbled back to my truck and grabbed the deer. I called my dad and told him my story and told him I was tired and was gonna take a nap in the parking lot. I was bloody as hell, scratches and cuts and bruises from branches hitting my exposed face. So, I took a nap and was woken by a tapping noise on my window and then a bright light. I don't know who was more scared, me or the Greenhorn DNR officer wide-eyed, slack-jawed, and baggy pants staring at the monstrosity I was. I told him the story, he checked my info and we had a good laugh and I went on my merry way. 
Now those who are going to ask why I didn't just drop my deer and let them have it, I don't know. It was only a five point, not very big. A very average deer. I'm just a stubborn ox who doesn't think things thoroughly. But hey, the deer was yummy. And for the DNR officer that I have a new brown set of undies too, I've seen him on three occasions since, all three ice fishing. He calls me Wildman and doesn't even check my information nor does he check my fish. We talk quite a bit when we see each other. I consider him a friend actually. I kept seeing a light flash and a clicking sound around the property I was staying at for a few days. I thought it was weird but assumed it was an animal sensor thing. The property was mostly surrounded by trees. With a light going off, also 5 to 10 seconds in between, I realized it was moving through the trees. I called out to the dog to bring her inside, and right after that, the light died. All I could hear was the clicking noise as I walked alongside the trees to the house. Okay, starting to get a bit concerned now, but I couldn't bolt for it. I felt like it was wise to avoid any sudden moves. So I walked to the door as normally as possible. The clicking sound behind me was somehow louder then. Got into the house and locked the door in two seconds. I was creeped out because I am partially deaf, meaning, I technically qualify for hearing aids but don't wear or need them ATM. If I was able to hear that sound, it indicates two possibilities, it was either a very loud and weird sensor or it was much closer than I realized. Nothing else happened after that. Now I believe I let my imagination run too far. But in the moment, it was pretty creepy. I used to live in a very rural area in my youth and when I had just turned 18, I was helping with a family friend's security company. It was October, about 9 p.m. and we had just starting the night shift of patrolling what was once a manor house. A little backstory on this place, rumor had it that the house was cursed and haunted by demons and tortured souls alike. In the time it had been standing it had been a simple place of residence, hotel, hospital, nursing home and was eventually left abandoned and derelict in the late 60s. In the 40 years it was abandoned, it had been broken into by kids and gangs and had occasionally been set on fire, all wanting to see this curse for themselves or believed it enough to want the place gone. I didn't buy the whole haunting thing but the place certainly made me feel a little uneasy. Back to the story, it was dark, like it always is at that time at the end of October. It was also cold. And usually the lights around the garden kept it light enough that we could see what we were doing without the need for torches. That was when the lights went out. All of them. That was weird but not to worry, we had the flashlights on our phones. But our phone screens were flickering. Okay, that was super weird. And if it stopped there I probably would have gone home believing that there was some sort of issue with the electricity in and surrounding the house. Some areas are like that, especially in rural places, I live in a rural area now and all the lights blow out and flicker a lot because the electrics just aren't that great. I wish I could say it stopped there. We heard screeching coming from the house. It didn't even sound human. I can't even describe it but it was enough for your stomach to drop like the floor just collapsed beneath you and make your blood curdle. And for what must have been a solid 30 seconds the inhuman screeching was accompanied by unintelligible whispers closer to us and the occasional shadow depicting various acts of suicide and self-mutilation. When we all determined that we did indeed experience what had just happened we called the police about the disturbance and hightailed it out of there as soon as they arrived. No evidence of there being anyone in the house was found, no signs of a break-in, nothing. Our team of four people were the only people on the property. I haven't set foot in there since, however the other guys did and as far as I'm aware, they never had an incident like that since. I'm a native Alaskan who grew up in the sticks. 
Once I was out hunting with an uncle. Well, I was there anyways, I was eight at the time. We had been trying to find a small moose for quite some time that we'd seen take off into the forest across a field. Everything seemed normal, except that the area was very quiet. Then again, we're two humans walking about so we figured maybe the wildlife was just being cautious. Well, eventually we caught up to it, at another clearing and my uncle decided to take a shot as it was getting later and we needed to get it skinned, gutted and butchered before the sun went down. He hit it in the heart and it only managed to stumble maybe another 60 feet to the edge of the forest. I complimented his shot, and we grabbed our gear and walked over. Now, before I tell you this next part, keep in mind that moose are weighed in the thousands of pounds, generally. We're getting closer, and my uncle can't see the moose anymore. Weird, because we'd seen it fall, and we knew it had been hit mortally. We get to the location and the thing is just... gone. My uncle starts to enter the forest and all my hair suddenly raised on my entire body and I made a whimper. I'm not a wuss, but I had a bad feeling. My uncle looks at me, annoyed and confused, and just maybe 30 feet away we hear heavy breathing. First thing we think is grizzly, so he pushes me behind himself and gets his gun ready and shouts as loud as he can. I don't know what it was, but it dropped the moose from at least a couple feet off the ground, we know because we heard the loud thud, and tears off running the other direction. It is dark in the understory so we don't see much, but my uncle decides the thing can have the moose. We weren't about to stick around to find out what could lift a whole moose into the air and carry it. Ten years as a USFS forest ranger here. A little late to this party, and not even sure where to start as a decade will leave you with countless stories. But I've nearly seen it all. A couple of my favorites both involve fire patrol during the summer months when we were enforcing fire restrictions. The first was a dude at a beautiful area, camped next to a lake. About 100 feet from his camp was a giant reflective yellow sign that read no camping or fires within half mile of the lake. When approached and asked if he'd seen the sign, he admitted that he saw it. Puzzled, I asked why he was camping there, and why he had a campfire. He replied that he figured he was half from the lake, so he should be fine. I kicked a stone into the water, and informed him that he was only about 10 feet from the lake, and I was going to need his ID, as I was going to issue him a citation. Another time, also on a late night fire patrol, we drove past a designated day use slash picnic area. This particular area had fire pits, benches, restrooms, water, it was well developed. Right outside the picnic area was this old trail that lead to a bridge site where the bridge was removed. Due to this we had placed a carsonite signpost, slender brown fiberglass post for informative stickers slash trail markers slash warnings. This particular post had stickers on it that said area closed slash no fires slash stay on designated trails and an American flag at the bottom. We roll up to a raging fire at this site. Fire so big and so close to the carsonite sign that my stickers are literally bubbling and starting to melt due to the heat. Pretty angrily I asked who wanted to be responsible for this blatant violation. The oldest guy there says he'll take responsibility for the party follows me to my truck and proceeds to give me his ID. In his police badge holder. He was a local police officer. I was floored. I gave him a stern lecture about reading signage and ultimately damaging government property. Endless stories though. Suicides, ATV accidents, bear attacks, very sad, far too many Boy Scout violations to count, poachers, murders, public nudity, sex in public, underage everything you can imagine, life flight helicopters, forest fires and air tankers, fire crews, enough said there. But all in all I truly miss the million acre office. The woods, the trees, animal encounters, the occasional well-informed forest visitors, and the endless views, vistas and sunsets. Getting paid to hike, mountain bike, dirt bike, motorcycles, snowmobile, jeep, 
and play outside for 10 years was clearly something I'll never forget. Back when we were about 14 my friends and I went up to stay at our buddy's family farm in rural New Hampshire. Not much up there besides farmland and miles of deep woods. It was around midnight, and we had just spent a few hours around, smoking cigars and building a bonfire up in one of the cow pastures. To get back to the house from the pasture, you needed to walk about half a mile through the woods and across another field, and the kid's dad had a tradition of messing with us on our way back. The usual routine was waiting on the porch and shooting Roman candles at us as we crossed the field. We started walking back, and as we emerged from the path, we started hearing loud rustling noises in the trees along the edge of the field about 70 yards away. We all ran into the middle of the field and hit the deck smiling, thinking my buddy's dad was about to start shooting fireworks at us. After about five minutes of the intermittent leaf rustling and no Roman candles, our smiles were gone and we started debating if it was a black bear or some other big animal. The rustling was distinctly the sound of footsteps, and would pick up and suddenly stop as if someone was running tree to tree. Thruly freaked out, my buddy pulls out his cell phone and calls the landline at his house. He stands up and walks a little in the direction of the house while my other friend and I stay laying down, staring in the direction of the noises. Suddenly, something runs out of the tree line. I will never forget this image for as long as I live. We were still about 50 yards away and there was only a crescent moon out so there wasn't much light to make out fine details, but we watched as this inhumanly tall thing strode across a portion of the field and then back into the trees. It was skinny, with disproportionately long limbs and in the dark appeared to be a solid light gray slash white color. As it ran, its incredibly long arms and legs swung in this disturbingly unusual way and it appeared to be moving much faster than it should have been. As fast as it had appeared, it was gone back into the forest. My friend and I looked at each other in silent horror. We stand up, ready to book it back to the house. My other friend walks back over to us, oblivious to what we just saw. His dad picked up. He said he's been in bed for an hour. Without saying anything, me and my friend who witnessed it started sprinting for our lives back to the house. The other friend follows suit. We make it back, lock all the doors and recount what we saw to the other friend and his dad. None of us slept that night. When we went downstairs in the morning, my friend's dad, whose bedroom was on the ground floor, tells us how throughout the night he heard something banging on the side of the house and windows, and claimed he went out several times with his shotgun to find nothing. We thought he was just messing with us at the time, but to this day he stands by that story. As someone who doesn't believe in the paranormal, it's not a story I tell often, but the two friends who were there and I still talk about regularly and it scares the s out of us. Just this year, I shared it with another buddy of mine who loves that type of stuff, and after a quick Google search he shows me something that refers to a devil. When I saw it I nearly defecated my pants. The description and depiction of this creature from local folklore matched what I saw perfectly. I honestly don't know what to believe, but I know what I saw, and it's safe to say you're never going to catch me in the NH woods past sunset again. Bonus creepiness. The stretch of forest adjacent to his family's farm has been known locally as Boneswood and Devilswood for as long as his family has lived in the area, several generations. So we're at this camper near the Dover Lights in Arkansas. It's not the fanciest campsite but we managed to find this guy that spent a lot of time out there, as much as legally allowed, while also working, and apparently making a lot of cash so he just vacations in the woods half the year. The guy offers to let my friend watch the place while he goes to visit his son. My friend automatically invites me and some other people to come hang out and we spend a few days there drinking, smoking, fishing, and screwing around. All in all pretty okay, until my female friend gets super drunk and barges outside in the middle of the night buck naked to eat beans by the handful out of a cold pot. 
As someone who admires cleanliness I follow her out and try to make sure she doesn't hurt herself while everyone else just laughs. So there she is covered in beans and I'm trying to convince her to settle down and clean herself off with a towel when suddenly her head shoots up like a deer in headlights. She just glares at the trees around us, we're alone and it's pitch black, before literally growling and then sprinting into the woods. I have no idea what to do. I've completely lost sight of her and she's naked in the woods by herself. A few failed attempts to call out to her and I do the stupidest thing I could have done by following her. About 5 meters into complete darkness I look down and see a faint light from someone's phone. Picking it up I see it's in camera mode and there are pictures of us, very recent pictures, all in creepy night vision mode, with some looking like they were taken from the window of the camper, and the last one is of my friend running directly towards the camera. Realizing what happened I delete the pictures and drop the phone on a rock, crushing the screen with my foot. Still unable to find her and freaking out I double back to the camper for help, only to find her still very drunk in a lawn chair naked. Carrying her back inside I let her BF towel her off and they both pass out spooning on the bottom bunk. I never told them what really happened and she didn't remember in the morning. But I did lock the door and wake up every hour just to keep an eye on things. I was with a trail ranger following a search of marsh land that was next to a national park. Backstory, we were on vacation from the UK where I was working at the time and we had basically had to go out to a company outing around Christmas time as it was when we started to party, work day off, entire company from the US offices was there. We had noticed one member of the team got drunk and basically wandered off somewhere. So we had to call rangers to find him, luckily we were being guided by a trail ranger. Before anyone says anything, getting really drunk in a national park is never a good idea. Most of us had one or two beers and that was it. This guy couldn't really handle his drink and also had way too much of the blue can stuff people nicknamed Redneck's Finest, not sure of the particular beer, more suited to European beers and pint glasses rather than this can stuff. We didn't find him for a while to the point it got dark, like really dark. So we had to get flashlights looking for the guy. After searching many hours, we managed to get a search team together. After several hours it felt like someone was following me, alone, in a national forest with only a mobile to contact us, so basically I got lost looking for the guy. Panic started to set in because I didn't know where the trail ranger had went a few miles beforehand. So alone, no idea where I was in marshland, walking on soil, a few tall trees in the distance. Along the way I hear what sounds like footsteps, muddy, like someone was walking behind me in the marsh. Turn the flashlight to face the noise, it stops. Continue walking. Hear it again, stop, turn around, point flashlight, it stops. Start to get really nervous. Happens again, get a sudden sense of dread, so shoot off running. Manage to reach the trees in the distance, heart pounding. I run into the guy we were searching for, along with the trail ranger, saying he had managed to track him. Told him what happened to me, told me that the place in the marsh was infested with alligators and that's the sound they make when they creep up on people. Says I was either very brave or very stupid to walk there because people have been grabbed by them before. We managed to make it back to the hotel with the guy slurring his words and still very drunk. Park ranger congratulates me on my balls to brave marshland, in reality I didn't know and wouldn't have went there if I had known. Still think about how differently it might have ended if I had known about the alligators. The noise is there when they creep up on you, but when alligators see flashlights they sometimes stop in the dark. Never knew that. Apparently a thing. There's some mountains behind a small town near where I used to work in the Arizona desert. One night, a good friend of mine and I decided to say screw it and actually hike up the mountain after work. Since I used to work mid-shift, this takes place at like 1 in the morning, I know, I'm an idiot. 
Anyway, we stay up there and have a real bro to bro conversation about the past. While he's telling me about his ex, I swear, even to this day, I heard someone whisper right into my ear. I asked him if he had whispered anything, and he declined. I just shook it off as weird. About an hour later, he interrupts me and has me turn around. I see nothing. I look back and ask him, what? He said he saw what looked like an orange fuzzy ball that moved quickly before disappearing. This really freaked him out but even with my previous whisper experience, I thought it was just mother nature playing games. Anyway, we finally decide that it's time to go, and just as we got to my truck is when things got super weird. I sit down, open the passenger side door for my friend, and I see what I can only describe as an orange fuzzy ball floating very quickly to the left. It disappeared once it got behind my friend. At the same time I witnessed this, my friend, who is an emotionally tough guy, begins screaming his lungs out. He literally hops into my truck, and tells me to get out of there. I tell him about the fuzzy ball once we leave and he just goes, huh. He then goes on to tell me that after I opened the door, he looked down and saw, and I quote, shadowy dog-like legs underneath the truck, as if it was laying down. We both nervously chuckle it off, and that's when I notice the time. 3.14 AM. The witching hour had just passed. I never believed in it beforehand, but that experience has made me rethink it. I was with my girlfriend in upstate New York in New Windsor I think. Really small trail, probably 45 minutes to complete the whole thing. But ran into some real creeps towards the end. In the middle of the trail there's this watchtower you can climb in above the tree line. My girlfriend and I climb it and spend about 10 minutes up there. Then we hear some footsteps on the ladder. I look down, and there are two young men climbing up with machetes slung across their back. I don't panic but my girlfriend starts freaking out. We are completely alone in the middle of this trail, just us two and our new visitors. Now, the watchtower viewing area at the top is maybe 20 square feet, so not a whole lot of room for four people. So I have my girlfriend standing behind me while these two guys come up and are acting all casual. Not a word is said for a couple minutes as these two young guys are just casually looking out above the tree line. I decide to break the silence and ask them what they're doing out here, and one of them says, we come out here pretty often looking for people. His tone was trying to be intimidating but I could just tell that it was somewhat fake. Either these two guys were just trying to scare us, or they were toying with us. I replied with a joke, oh, you must have hid the bodies really well. And everyone except my girlfriend who is still behind me laughs. We spend a few more minutes up there. I am getting pretty nervous because no words are being said. All I'm doing is watching their hands to see if they make a move for their machete. Then, they both make their way down the watchtower. Not a goodbye. Nothing. My girlfriend and I watch them run off of the trails and to the woods. We discuss how weird it was. And how they were just trying to scare us. We decide that we are going to climb down and sprint our way to the car. We wound up getting to the car and getting out of there. As we are driving, my girlfriend tells me that she actually knew one of the kids they went to the same high school. I was about 20 at the time she was 22. She tells me how he was one of those kids that was weird and got bullied in school and all those great attributes that you hope to see in a guy with a machete in the middle of the woods. And how my girlfriend was one of the people who bullied him. I was a cadet weekend six or so years ago at Thetford Training Ground, East Anglia, UK. It has been a training ground for a good century and a bit so. Lots of history to the area however haven't found much evidence of any notable haunting in the area. Had a really good time but a few slightly weird things happened which no one was able to explain. No large native animals other than the odd fox or badger but they tend to steer generally clear due to the nature of the exercises, military so involve gunfire. 
quite diverse landscape for England with open spaces, pine trees, with large open clearings, shrubs dotted across the place etc. Five of us cadets were on patrol through the pine tree covered areas on the outskirts of a big, plain clearing, around 3 square km. Only distinguishable feature was a large mound in the middle of this clearing. Anyway one of us shouts a stand to in an excitement and slight confusion as to what he could have seen we all eagerly take a position. Lead pointing my rifle in same general direction as everyone else looking for the threat. Nico then tells us how he saw a figure on top of the mound and that it was probably the sergeant testing us. So we vigilantly go over low and behold there is no one. Remember then Ko who was only 16 I was about 13 at the time being very creeped out. 13 year old me was slightly amused but mainly just ecstatic at being out in the woods, no adults and with rifles, no magazines though, ah. Could he have been messing with us? Of course, but something tells me he probably wasn't. Later on we set up camp in a lightly forested area and get on sentry duties. I took one of the first watches and felt very creeped out, as if I was being watched. I had my rifle with me giving me a weird sense of confidence so brushed it off and lay there for a few hours. Later on in the night another sentry orders a stand to and we all hear rustling in the bushes, pretty loud and we're all a little spooked. The adults go and investigate and come back telling us it's a rogue sheep from a nearby farm haha. -ha. Anyway fast forward to the bus back and they tell us they never found the exact cause of this noise but didn't want to scare us by admitting that last night. One of the adults also told me later she's always found that ground creepy. This woman is pretty nails and never appeared to be scared by much but admitted that she once was walking back to camp at night and swore she was being followed by footsteps that stopped when hers did. She really never took any jokes well and did not have much of a sense of humor but still, maybe she was messing with us all along and this was an elaborate prank. However she was not the sort to do this haha -ha, not essentially too creepy but still slightly out of the norm. I used to be a park ranger and there are some things people need to know about what's in the forests. Five years ago I became a park ranger. I won't include the location of this event. I don't want anyone seeking out the utter horrors I've seen in that forest. You think that you're prepared for whatever the forest might throw at you. You hear about the strange occurrences from other rangers, the missing persons cases, the unusual animals that are like nothing you've ever seen before. I was arrogant. I just blew off these stories the other more experienced rangers told me as nothing but paranoia or attempts to scare the new guy. But I was wrong. I was so very wrong. I had to tell this event to someone. To warn people of the things that are out there hiding in those deep woods. Just waiting for that bold individual to walk right into their clutches. This is the reason I will never return to that forest and now live in a large city. I avoid the forests that I used to love so much because I'm terrified of what I'll find in them. Or what will find me. Three months into my time as a park ranger it was the beginning of spring. For the past two weeks, we had been receiving strange reports from park visitors and a few fellow rangers. People had been seeing strange warped looking animals wandering about the park. The animals sighted off and looked thin with patches of missing hair, had completely white eyes, were gaunt and almost skeletal, and the proportions of the animals were said to just seem wrong. As if the animals were just not completely convincing copies of the animals they were supposed to be. Of course, most of us just assumed there was some sort of disease starting to affect animals in the park. There was an older park ranger, who'd started at the park a month before the sighting started, named Briggs who warned us that he'd seen this before. He was worried was insisting we should close up the park. He said that the animals were dangerous and a safety hazard to anyone inside the forest, but he wouldn't say any more than that. He just always looked haunted when he talked about those animals and said the forest wasn't safe anymore. Of course, we just wrote him off as being a cookie paranoid older guy who'd probably had some kind of traumatic wild animal attack experience. We didn't even entertain the possibility that he might be right. And our hubris would be our downfall. 
I still remember something Briggs said to me one day shortly before he quit working at the park. It always was weird to me that Briggs was so disturbed by these animal reports and looked so haunted when he talked about them. He was a big man in his late 70s, but he could have easily wiped the floor with any youngster who tried to step up to him. He was an ex-Navy SEAL and a tough and real smart son of a gun. I was surprised he was so superstitious and paranoid that we should close up the park when it just seemed like some outbreak of a disease among some of the wildlife. All in all, it didn't seem like a big deal at the time. Briggs wouldn't say specifically why he was so insistent on closing up the park. All he would say to me on the subject was, there are things in that forest you couldn't comprehend boy. Things that'll break a grown man in two like a twig. They're smart you know. We think we're the apex predator of this world, but we couldn't be more wrong. If you aren't afraid, you're a fool. They're coming out in droves and I don't know why. But I don't plan on being here to find out. I've seen the horrors of War Sunny. And what I saw on the battlefield is nothing compared to what I've seen in that forest. Do the wise thing and listen to this old timer before it's too late. I just wrote off what Briggs told me. But now I wish I hadn't. If I could I would go back and change what I'd done, but it's too late now. And the horrors I saw will stick with me as long as I live. One week after Briggs warned us to close down the park he quit and left the park behind. He was the smart one. He knew what was coming and didn't want to be around when all hell broke loose. I saw a glimpse of one of those strange animals on one of my patrols within that week, but it just looked like a sick raccoon to me. I thought nothing of it and it was gone before I could attempt to catch it. But within five weeks of these sightings beginning, things had started to become stranger. We did 10 reports from park visitors of being attacked by these sickly looking animals. All of them had told us the same thing. The animals seemed intelligent now, like they were hunting them. They seemed intelligent, and they seemed angry. We were bewildered and unsure of what to make of the situation. We'd been trying to hunt down and put down the sick animals since the report started. We decided it was wiser to put down these animals to keep the sickness from spreading, but the animals remained elusive. The most any of us were able to do was catch occasional glimpses of them. But that all changed one night on the sixth week of the sightings. We'd also had 10 missing persons cases brought to our door within the past two weeks. Though we were unsure if this was attached to the sick animal sightings and were unable to find any traces of the missing people aside from some abandoned belongings and campsites. On a seemingly peaceful summer night, three of us were at the ranger's station on the overnight shift. It was myself, Hank a tough hulking man in his early 30s, and Lydia a petite girl in her late teens who was interning at the park over the summer. We had increased employee presence in the park due to the strange animal behavior of the past two or so months. It was close to 10 at night when we had a hysterical young blonde woman rushing into the station. She was covered in dirt and scratches, her clothing in tatters. She looked wild, like someone who'd been lost in the forest for weeks. She was sobbing, babbling, and collapsed into the arms of Hank. I started to check her for and treat her injuries as we tried to calm the woman down enough for her to speak clearly. After an hour we managed to calm her down enough for her to be able to speak in somewhat coherent sentences. She was still hard to understand, but we managed to get the gist of what she had to say. The woman told us that she'd been camping in the park with her four friends. They'd set up camp in the morning and everything had seemed normal but after the sun set things started to become strange. They started to hear odd noises coming from the forest and swore that they even heard talking. Though the voices sounded garbled and growled almost like someone who still wasn't completely sure how to form words. They'd started to feel on edge and had decided to leave first thing in the morning, but were too scared to venture out into the forest in the middle of the night with the strange noises they were hearing. She told us that after an hour of hearing the strange noises coming from the forest a stumbling and almost hairless sickly gaunt coyote with pure white eyes came out of the forest and started venturing into the clearing where they had set up camp. The coyote was making strange noises like it was in pain and the closer it got the easier it was for them to see that the coyote seemed off. 
She said that the coyote seemed just a little too long and too tall to be a coyote, like it had been stretched or something. As the coyote got closer her friend Trace got scared and decided to throw a rock at the coyote to scare it off. Instead of throwing the rock near the coyote he threw a fist-sized rock at the coyote and hit it square in the head. The rock hit the coyote and it collapsed to the ground. After the rock hit the coyote the forest seemed to go completely still almost like time had stopped. The only sounds the five of them could hear were their own terrified breathing and the crackling of the campfire. They thought Trace had killed the coyote. In the eerie silence, they could see that it wasn't breathing. But then the coyote's body jerked. Strange cracking noises could be heard from the coyote's body as it twitched and contorted. Its body changed into an almost humanoid shape as it rose up on two legs. The coyote bared its teeth at the five of them in a sneer and then opened its mouth. They heard the coyote speak two chilling words in a deep guttural voice, feeding time. These two words seemed to send the forest into chaos as creatures of varying shapes and sizes swarmed from the tree line upon the five campers. Not all of the animals even seemed to look like animals or like anything the girl had ever seen before. The creatures dragged the five of them through the forest to a cave, dragging them inside into what seemed to be a dark and massive cave system. This is something I found strange considering that the only caves we had in this park were relatively small. There should have been nothing in that park like what this girl was describing. She told us that the animals dragged them into this cave system and trapped them in some kind of sticky wispy substance that seemed almost like spider webs but with the strength of thick rope. She said she could barely remember what happened after that since she couldn't see it all in the pitch black cave. All she could hear was the occasional screams of terror and pain from her friends and the squelching noises of what she knew was her friends being eaten. She wasn't sure how long she was in there. What she guessed was every few days one of them would be taken and fed upon by what she could only guess was the creatures that took them into the caves. The creatures also would force feed her water and food every so often. Though it was clear from her gaunt and emaciated figure they only fed her enough to keep her alive. She said she was fed some kind of mush she was never able to identify. Only that it tasted utterly foul and almost like something rotten. When it was finally her turn to be eaten she got lucky. She felt the threads that bound her being cut by what seemed to be some large claw or knife and then she crashed to the cave floor. In a panic, she managed to grab a large rock. She struck out in the darkness towards where she believed to be the thing that had cut her loose. She could tell she made contact with something and heard a growl of pain as the creature hit the ground. She didn't wait to figure out how much damage she'd done. She'd just run. She ran for what felt like hours. She could hear the sounds of growls and what seemed like garbled speech she couldn't understand all around her, but somehow she managed to avoid the creatures who were hunting for her. She managed to escape the cave system and just ran blindly through the forest in the dark until she found the ranger station. After finishing the story she just burst into sobs and begged us to protect her from the monsters that she thought were still chasing her. We realized, after hearing her story, that she was part of a group of five campers who'd gone missing in the forest two weeks earlier. It was a group of college students who'd come to the park on summer break, but after the first day of their camping trip their families and friends had stopped hearing from them. After three days of no contact from the students, we'd been notified that these campers were to be considered officially missing. We'd been contacted by the families even earlier than that and had run some preliminary searches but, like the five other missing persons that had cropped up in the past two weeks, we'd only found an abandoned campsite and belongings from the campers. After some closer inspection of the girl and some coaxing for her name, we managed to identify her as one of the two missing girls, Abigail. At the time we believed that Abigail and her friends were likely drugged and attacked by some dangerous individuals in the forest. It was easier to think that Abigail had just crafted this unbelievable narrative as a way to comprehend what happened to her while she was kept heavily drugged and docile. After all, what sane and reasonable person could honestly believe the wild tale Abigail had spun? 
We left Abigail to eat and discussed amongst the three of us for a bit about what to do with her. We were quick to decide that the best course of action was to notify law enforcement that we'd found Abigail and that there were likely a group of dangerous individuals currently residing in the park. The three of us felt very disconcerted after hearing Abigail's story, but knew that we couldn't very well abandon our post in the early hours of our shift. At that point, we all just wanted to get Abigail somewhere safe and really wanted to leave the park, even though we couldn't. First I tried to call the police through the office phone, but the line was dead. That far out in the middle of nowhere phone service can be notoriously unreliable, so our mobiles couldn't be used to call the police either. The office phones were really our only way to contact the outside world unless we felt like wandering about until we managed to possibly get a bar of service. With the phone lines down we just decided to shut down for the night and take Abigail to the police station ourselves. As we were gathering our things and shutting off the lights for the night we all moved with a mutual sense of urgency. Human instinct is a powerful thing and at that moment all of us seemed to sense that something was wrong. Suddenly Abigail started screaming loud enough that I was sure she could actually crack the windows. She started pointing towards the window straight across from the couch she sat on and screeching, it's here. They're here. You have to help me. They're coming for me. Initially, I thought that the girl was just hysterical. That was until I saw it. The thing was exactly like Abigail had described. It was a too tall bipedal thing with gangly but muscled limbs and a patchy furred body. It had to be at least 8 feet tall with the way its torso was the only part initially visible when I looked out the window. Then it crouched down and tapped a clawed hand on the glass. It had the head of a coyote with those milky white eyes. It grinned and let out a growl. Come out. It purred in a gravelly sing-song voice. Abigail screamed and backpedaled away from the window, hiding behind and latching onto Hank while yelling that we needed to escape and begging us not to let them take her. I was frozen in fear. I was in no way equipped to handle this. I was just an average guy from Iowa with no special skills to speak of besides being decently athletic with an encyclopedic knowledge of the outdoors. The only thing I could do at that moment was stand frozen and staring in horror at the thing peering at us through the window and chuckling at our terrified faces. Surprisingly, what snapped me out of my shell shock state was Lita. She was the only one out of us who didn't look scared. Instead, she looked angry. She smacked me across the face hard enough to leave my ears ringing. Then she proceeded to do the same with Hank. Hank and I shared mirrored surprised expressions that Lita was so quick to action, and that her small form could hit that hard. Get yourself together. You all need to get the hell out of here, Lita yelled at the three of us. She then proceeded to remove a black pistol from her pastel blue backpack. A multitude of questions were rushing through my mind. At the top of that list was wanting to know what the hell that thing outside was and right below that was bewilderment at Lita's 180 shift from a bubbly perky teenager to acting like some battle-hardened veteran. I didn't have much time to spend on these musings however as we heard the window crack. The coyote thing had placed a hard punch to the window that had caused it to fracture. One more good hit would surely shatter it. Then Lita raised her gun and fired. The bullet shattered the window and sent the coyote crashing back to the ground. Hurry. Get to Hank's truck. And get your guns, Lita yelled. Hank and I already had our shotguns out and ready due to the reports of animal attacks. So we were able to snatch them up quickly as Lita took the lead to head for the front door. Abigail continued to stick close to Hank silently with wide terrified eyes as we moved cautiously for the door. Lita threw open the door and I was shocked at what we were faced with. There were at least 30 of those warped animals we'd heard so much about. And at the head of them was the coyote with a now missing left arm and the shoulder stump looking like it had healed over years ago. The coyote was the only one to be in a bipedal form. The other animals looked warped in various shapes and sizes, some being recognizable animals and others simply looking like horrifying beasts I had never seen before. The only thing they all had in common was those white eyes. 
The coyote snarled and seemed to focus its attention on Lita. You'll pay for that. It growled out. Lita sneered at the coyote in response. Shove it you overgrown flea bag. She shot back as she reached into her backpack and produced a flare which she was quick to light and hold out in front of her. The creatures recoiled at the light and the coyote let out a deep unearthly growl. She hurled the flare into the crowd of animals and they scattered with unnatural speed back from the flare. Go, Lydia yelled and the four of us made a break for it to the parking lot while we had the opening. Lydia took the lead, taking a shot at any of the creatures who tried to leap at us as we ran. Her bullets seemed to have a strange effect on the creatures. The moment they hit black liquid bubbled up from the injuries and the things would screech in pain as their bodies seemed to start to dissolve into that black liquid. Hank and I took a few shots at the things, but our bullets didn't seem to do much more than knock the creatures back briefly. When we did get to the truck we all quickly piled in with Hank in the driver's seat and he gunned it towards the exit to the park right after the engine roared to life. I let out a breath of relief as I thought we were home free. Don't start relaxing. We're not out of the woods yet, Lita scolded me and then offered a hint of a smirk at the terrible joke she'd made. I looked at her in disbelief for a moment before an uneasy chuckle escaped from Hank and me, appreciating her attempt at calming the three of us at least. Lita's smirk quickly faded as she focused her attention on the blurred view of the forest outside the car as Hank sped along the road. So, who the hell are you? Hank asked as he kept his eyes focused on the road. But it was clear the question was meant for Lita. It was an unspoken question that had been hanging in the air ever since Lita jumped into action to deal with that coyote thing back in the ranger station. I'll tell you what Hank, I'll give you a nice lengthy explanation after we're out of the forest full of things itching to get at us. Sound good? She responded flatly. Hank gave a sigh in response. Fine fine. Fair enough. Do you at least know what those things are? He pressed. Yes, Lita said shortly. Then she sighed heavily. All you need to know is that they're really hard to kill and that if you want to bring them down you'd better aim for the vitals. They won't stop moving until their bodies are completely destroyed. Their eyes are sensitive to light and they'll naturally flee from it. Fire also does a nice job of doing heavy damage to them. You manage to engulf one in flames and they'll go up like a bonfire doused in gasoline. But get back quick before they explode unless you want to go smelling like roadkill that won't wear off for weeks. Exception to the flame rule is that coyote thing. Fire'll hurt it, but it's not enough to kill it. If something happens you leave me to deal with the coyote while you all focus on escaping. The coyote gets taken out and the animals will stop attacking. They'll still be those things, but they won't be coordinated anymore. So it'll give you all the opening you need to get out. She explained. I stared at Lita with wide eyes, wondering how exactly it was she knew all this. I could tell Hank was wondering the same thing. But it was clear this was all Lita was willing to tell us at the moment. Abigail remained quiet in the backseat with me. She was just staring out the window with wide vacant eyes. Not that I could blame her after all she'd been through. I guessed she just needed time to process everything. Before I could speak up and ask Abigail anything I heard a loud metallic crunch and then we were airborne. I caught a flash of brown fur before the truck tumbled off the road, rolled down a steep hill, and came to a rest on its roof, having been stopped by a large pine tree. I sat suspended in the air by my seat belt with my ears ringing and my body trying to process the shock of the crash. I was snapped out of my dazed state by Lita cursing loudly. Man! The truck is broken! She huffed out as she unclicked her seat belt and crashed to the roof of the car. Is everybody okay? She asked as she shifted to look at the rest of us. Lita had a deep cut on her right cheek and forearm with some various cuts and bruises scattered across her form as well, but she seemed mostly unharmed. I'm okay, I think. I choked out before undoing my seatbelt as well and hitting the roof of the car with a pain grunt. Aside from some cuts and being sore as hell I was fine as far as I could tell. 
Hank was similarly mostly unharmed aside from a thick bit of glass that had gotten stuck in his left bicep, but that was able to be quickly tended to by Lita by taking the glass out and tearing off a bit of his sleeve to tie around the wound. Abigail appeared to have passed out from the crash. She had a few deep gashes on her forearms and some smaller scratches, but otherwise, she seemed unharmed. However, she was unconscious and it was difficult to assess how she really was until she woke up. Something odd I noticed about her that I wish I had paid more attention to was that her blood looked almost black. But I just assumed I was seeing things because of the poor lighting and already being very on edge. Hank and I gently removed Abigail from the wreckage of the truck while Lita surveyed the damage and tried to figure out exactly where we were. The truck was an absolute wreck. The passenger side had collapsed inward like something heavy had made impact with it and the resulting roll down the hill and crash into the pine tree had completely totaled the truck. We were lucky the truck was as sturdy as it was or we would have surely walked away with worse injuries than we had. We'll have to continue on foot from here, Lita said before placing a hand over Abigail's mouth and giving her a hard smack to the cheek to see if she could wake her. Abigail woke with a start, but her resulting scream was muffled by Lita's hand over her mouth. Once Abigail took in her surroundings Lita tore the sleeves off her own shirt and used the cloth to treat Abigail's wounds on her forearms. Come on, we need to get moving before they catch up with us. She barked. The three of us followed behind Lita with Abigail in between the three of us considering her unarmed and mostly unresponsive state. We all moved at a brisk walking pace, sticking to the shadows of the tree line, but never completely leaving the view of the road just in case a car happened to come by. For a while, we were able to continue on without interruption. The forest was almost completely quiet, not even a sound from an insect could be heard. The only sounds we could hear were the occasional howl or growl in the distance and the sounds of our footsteps and heavy breaths. Despite the terrors of the night, this was perhaps one of the most terrifying parts to me. That utter quiet in the sense that at any moment one of those things could rush from the forest to do who knows what. Then the silence was broken as a thing that resembled a large deformed porcupine the size of a wolf rushed at us from the underbrush. Lita fired off a bullet into the creature's chest before it could make contact and it screeched and quickly started to dissolve as it writhed on the ground. Then the sounds of more growls and rushing footsteps could be heard as reinforcements rushed towards the area, attracted by the gunshot and the screeches of pain from the porcupine-like creature. Run, Lita yelled before breaking off into a sprint. The three of us quickly followed with Abigail pulling ahead of Hank and myself despite her frail condition. She had enough sense to at least not run out ahead of Lita, but her swift movements were startling. At the time I chalked it up to adrenaline. We ran with the sounds of those creatures pursuing us filling the forest around us. Lita, Hank, and I fired off the occasional shot when one of the things tried to jump at us from the forest, but we managed to keep ahead of the creatures. Or, that's what we thought anyway. As we emerged out into a large clearing the moonlight illuminated the coyote who seemed to be even larger than the last time we'd seen it. Though its left arm was still missing. Behind it stood a large half circle of those creatures of numbers of at least 50 who all stood waiting, hissing and snarling as if they desired nothing but to charge and tear us apart. Liddy didn't hesitate to raise her gun and take a shot at the coyote. But when she did all that sounded was an empty click. She was out of bullets. F, she said softly under her breath, quickly reaching to the side pocket of her backpack as if reaching for more ammo. Before she could reach the side pocket a squirrel-like thing the size of a large dog came crashing down from the tree above and smacked into her back. Lita cursed as she struggled against the creature, but it held firm. Hank raised his shotgun to try and shoot the squirrel creature off of Lita, but as he made that move he was knocked to the ground by the small frail form of Abigail. She had landed a hard elbow to his ribs that caused a loud crunch. Hank groaned in pain as he instinctively curled into himself and Abigail took that opportunity to pin him to the ground on his stomach with a too wide grin settling on her features that showed sharp teeth. Her eyes were white now like all those other things. 
As she held him her body started twisting and crunching as her limbs grew longer and distorted with her skin taking on a papery white shade with a gray tinge. She bit into the side of Hank's neck and he let out a pained gurgled sound as she took a chunk out of the side of his neck. Damn it! Hank, Lydia yelled as she struggled still against her captor. Then she looked at me with an intense gaze. Get out of here, she roared with a tinge of desperation in her voice. In that moment my survival instincts took over and I listened. It was as if my body went on autopilot while my mind raced. I thought that I couldn't just leave Lita and Hank behind. I had to stay and try to save them. But even as I thought this I kept running like my body had a will of its own separate from my mind. I tore through the forest, everything fading into a blur as I just focused on what was ahead of me. I don't know how long I ran for. But eventually I felt something heavy crash into me. I hit the ground roughly and felt the wind get knocked out of me. I briefly saw the shattered outline of a hulking figure before I fell unconscious from the hard impact. When I woke up everything was still dark. I wondered if I was even still alive. All I knew was that it was dark and I couldn't move. Then I heard a groan from nearby. Ah. I heard Lita's voice say softly before I heard a slight rustling like someone was struggling. Lita? I croaked out in question and I heard a gasp from nearby. Thank goodness, you're still alive. She breathed. Then she let out a more frustrated sound. But that means they caught you. Look. I have a plan to get us out of here, but you need to do exactly what I say if you want to survive this, she said in a hushed tone. What about Hank? I whispered back and Lita was quiet for a long moment before she spoke up again. Hank's beyond saving now. You, you don't want to know. Trust me, she said with a pained whisper. Now stop talking. You don't want them knowing you're awake. And whatever you do, don't let them feed you anything, she said with a renewally steeled tone. I did as I was told and shut up after that. I don't know how long we stayed in that darkness. I could feel myself suspended in the air and completely unable to move. It felt like I was wrapped up in some kind of cocoon made of a sticky substance similar to that of a spider's web. It was exactly the same conditions that Abigail had described in her story. The only sounds I heard all that time were an occasional shuffling, which I assumed to be Lita, and the distant sound of footsteps and soft growls. After what could have been hours or even days of just staying silent in that oppressive darkness I heard a ripping noise, and then a loud thunk and a grunt. I wanted to speak, but remembered Lida's words and forced myself to remain quiet. I just waited and hoped that that was the sound of Lida escaping. I heard footsteps approaching me and held my breath while attempting to press myself back against the stone wall behind me on a deep-rooted instinct to cringe away from the unknown thing that approached. Then I heard a ripping noise shortly before my bindings gave way and I went crashing unceremoniously to the rock floor below. While I lay there with the wind knocked out of me litter ripped the sticky bindings away from me and I quickly scrambled to my feet. You're going to have to trust me. Stay close to me and I'll get you out of here, Lita whispered in my ear. I nodded before realizing she couldn't see me in the pitch darkness and instead whispered back. Okay. It was all I could think to say at that moment. I heard a strange crunching noise and then Lita grabbed my hand and started to swiftly lead me along as if she was able to see where she was going. I noticed that her nails felt sharper than before as she held tight to my hand. I felt fear bubble up as I wondered if she was becoming something like what Abigail had turned into. But I forced myself to bury that fear. Right then, Lita was my only chance of making it out of that place. I had to trust her. I didn't have any other option. We moved through the darkness for what seemed like forever. We seemed to be moving through some sort of massive tunnel or cave network like the one from Abigail's story. We would mostly move with hurried steps, but on various occasions Lita would stop me and pull me into little crevices or side tunnels when the sounds of footsteps neared us. Then after the footsteps faded we would continue on our way again. I began to wonder if we would just be wandering this cave network until we finally just collapsed. I could already feel the hunger, dehydration, and exhaustion gnawing at me. But I kept pace with Lita, 
forcing myself to keep walking even when it felt like my legs were turning to stone. Then I finally saw a beautiful sight. There was light streaming into the stony area about 15 feet ahead of us after we turned a corner. As we drew closer to the light I could see that it was moonlight streaming into a large hole of some sort that looked to have been dug by massive claws. The hole was roughly 5 feet above us and led into some kind of tunnel to the surface. I felt my heart sink as I realized there was no way we could reach the hole to escape through it. We would have to continue on back into the darkness. I'll boost you up to the edge of the hole. Do you think you can pull yourself out? Lita spoke up as I let myself fall into a crestfallen state. I looked at Lita's petite five-foot form in bewilderment. I felt my eyes widen as I was finally able to take in her appearance. Lita's form had changed. She had grown more muscle and she looked practically feral. Her short black hair was wild and she was covered in dirt, but she looked uninjured despite her dirty appearance and very torn bloodstained clothing. Her nails had turned to claws and when she spoke I could see her teeth had changed to sharpened points. When I finally met her eyes they were no longer that piercing hazel green they had been. Now her pupils had changed to slits and her eyes were a glowing gold shade. I instinctively took a few steps back from her as I took in her inhuman features and she firmly grabbed my wrist. Now isn't the time. I told you. If you want to make it out of this you're going to have to trust me, she said firmly. I slowly nodded and she released me in return. Then she laced her fingers together and placed her palms upward to allow me to step on them so she could lift me to the hole. I complied and she lifted me with surprising ease. I dug my fingers into the dirt and scrabbled my way up through the hole and out into the forest above. I collapsed onto the ground on my back, taking in deep lungfuls of air for a moment and let out a short laugh of relief to be away from that horrid darkness. Then I remembered Lita. I looked down through the hole that appeared to be an animal burrow hidden beneath a large thick bush from the outside. Lita looked up at me with glowing golden orbs before she jumped upwards and dug her clawed hands into the dirt. I grabbed her hands and helped pull her out of the hole. Though I'm not entirely sure she needed my help at all. Once we were both out in the forest Lita held a hand up when she saw me about to speak. No questions. Not until we're out of here. Don't talk. Just follow and do what I say. That's how you're going to make it to see the sunrise, she said in a voice that left no room for argument. I just nodded in response to show her I understood. She nodded back and then we were off. The forest was still as strangely quiet as it was when we were captured and I wondered if it was even the same night anymore. I had no idea how many days had passed since we had taken down into the cave network. We could have been down in that cave system for days for all I knew. We just walked in silence as the moon moved across the sky. I didn't ask where we were going. All I knew to do at that point was follow Lita and hope that she had a plan. Lita seemed to tense some as we walked, but she said nothing beyond making a circular upward motion with her hand that I took to mean as be on your guard. You're quite the clever little girl. Such a shame that you chose the wrong side of this war. A deep rumbling voice spoke that seemed to echo around us. Little let out a soft growl in response. Yeah? If you're so upset about it then why not come and handle me yourself? Unless you're too scared to face me directly. You seem chicken with the way you're having all your lackeys do the fighting for you. She barked back which earned cold laughter from the voice which I assumed to belong to the coyote since it was the only one of the creatures I had heard actually speak up to that point. Then a dark shape seemed to emerge from a nearby oak tree that quickly shifted and took the form of that coyote I was beginning to grow familiar with seeing. It was grinning at us with its head cocked to the side ever so slightly as if it were amused. As you wish, he said before he rushed at us with alarming speed. Lita was backhanded hard enough that she went flying through a number of trees which crashed to the ground as Lita skidded to a stop on all fours roughly 30 feet away. The deep gouges in her forearms she'd gotten from the coyote's claws were already healing as she charged at the coyote. The coyote let out a roar that was mixed with laughter as Lita charged at it as if it were relishing the challenge that had been presented to it. 
The ensuing fight was one I only caught glimpses of as I attempted to distance myself from the two. I saw glimpses of Lita savagely tearing into the coyote and drawing inky black blood from the thing with each hit. She was superhumanly strong with the way she was able to send the coyote flying. It had grown to be at least twice her size by that point with a far more muscled figure than its previously gaunt form. The fight between the two seemed as if it would never end as they destroyed the forest around them. Every time the two dealt injuries to the other they would heal almost as fast as they were given. Trees felled around the two and slowly their battle zone was changed more into a clearing filled with jagged stumps and fallen trees. Despite Lita's strength she still seemed out of her league against the coyote. As fast as she was able to heal the coyote still dealt more damage than Lita and seemed to land attacks on her far more often than she did to it. And yet she never seemed to tire or give up. She just looked at the coyote with this deep-seated rage as she stubbornly continued to battle it. I stayed hidden behind a large rock on a small cleave near their battlefield. I should have run, but I just couldn't as I watched in horror, and yet almost wonder, as the two superhuman entities clashed. I just silently hoped their fight would not come near to me as I knew I would only get in the way or get hurt in this battle between two things who were far beyond the strength of a normal person like me. I could already see Lita was facing a challenge against the coyote with it only having one arm and I wondered just how dangerous would this thing be without that handicap. Then I quickly pushed that thought away as I felt panic overtaking me at that idea. Whatever the hell this thing was. It was a monster of overwhelming strength that I could still barely fathom the existence of. Finally the coyote got the upper hand, if you could even really call the hulking patchy furred thing a coyote anymore. It managed to pin Lita to the ground with its massive clawed hand holding her down by her throat and upper chest. Lita choked and gagged as she clawed and kicked at the coyote's arm, and it just laughed at her struggling even with her claws tearing chunks from its arm. I felt panic build up in my chest at the sight. I felt as if I had to do something to help Lita, but I had no idea what I could do. If Lita wasn't able to stop that thing there was no way I stood a chance. But I decided that I couldn't leave Lita to just perish at the hands of this thing. I'd already lost Hank. I couldn't just stand by and lose her too. I picked up a heavy rock from the ground nearby and attempted to stealthily approach the coyote while its attention was focused on Lita. You make such delicious prey little girl. Such a shame that you didn't last longer. It has been so long since I've been provided such a challenge. My compliments. Even your mother wasn't quite so strong as you. But alas, you'll suffer the same fate as she did. The coyote hummed with glee while Lita glared up at it with seething hatred in her expression. I'll kill you. She snarled back in a choked gasping voice as she more viciously attempted to struggle loose from the grip of the thing. Ah, still so spirited. I'm sure that fire in you will only make you an even more delectable morsel. The coyote chuckled, simply seeming amused by Lita's fury. The coyote opened its jaws wide as its face split into four even pieces and opened like horrific flower petals to reveal a large black maw lined with white needle sharp teeth and out from its throat flickered a deep red tongue reminiscent of a massive octopus tentacle lined with suckers that had silver spikes at the centers. I rushed forwards to hurl the rock right at the head of the creature and hopefully distract it long enough to let Lita get loose. The thing closed in as if aiming to bite into Lita with its monstrous mouth. I felt a sinking in my chest. I was too late. Even with Lita's astounding healing abilities, there was no way she could survive her head being bitten off. But then the thing's chest exploded in black gore as a loud bang sounded throughout the forest. Its body was soon torn apart by more explosions as more loud bangs filled the forest. Lita bolted to her feet as the creature's body started to dissolve into that black liquid I had seen the other things dissolve into. Its head flopped to the ground and changed back to the more coyote-like shape. Somehow it spoke even with its head now being the only solid piece of it left. This, isn't, over, it hissed out. You haven't seen the last of, me. We will have, our victory, it gasped. 
Then its head exploded in another burst of gore and all that was left of the beast was puddles of black goo that quickly dried and floated up into the air in little black flecks as the sky started to change with the first shades of dawn. I felt the rock drop from my hands as a familiar voice spoke from the edge of the tree line. You sure made quite a mess here, huh? I turned and couldn't believe my eyes. There Briggs stood with a shotgun in hand and a proud grin present on his face. Lee gave Briggs a withering look in response. Took you long enough, Grandpa. Those damn reinforcements you promised were almost too late. We lost some good people while you jackasses sat around with your thumbs up your asses, she scolded the older man. I felt my mind begin to swim as I tried to process all the events that had transpired over the course of the terrifying affair. As I tried to take in the scene in front of me of the heated back and forth between Lydda and Briggs all their voices sounded like to me were far away echoes. Blackness started to form at the edges of my vision. And then I fell unconscious. When I woke up I was in a hospital in the nearest city to the state park. I was told I'd been transported to the hospital from a clinic in the nearby town to the state park. According to the hospital staff I had been brought in with deep gashes, dehydrated, and emaciated. I'd apparently woken up and spoken deliriously of monstrous animals attacking. So it was assumed I'd been attacked by either a bear or wildcat, based on my injuries, and had become lost in the forest for days before eventually being discovered by two hikers. At first, I attempted to argue and recount what really happened, but I quickly figured out that the hospital staff just assumed I was still delirious. They weren't going to believe me. I did discover that it had been a week and a half since the night that those things first attacked. After I was discharged from the hospital I immediately quit my job at the state park. My supervisors didn't ask any questions. I saw that a missing persons report had been filed for Hank, but no law enforcement ever questioned me about what happened at the state park. In fact, there was never any reports at all of what happened in the park that night. And after that night the strange animal sightings in the park just fizzled off soon after. I thought about going to the police and telling them my story about what happened, but I knew that they would just ignore what I said. After all, who would believe such a strange story? I hadn't believed Abigail at first. Surely no one would believe me either. Since then I've moved across the country to a large city in an arid climate full of flatlands and desert. I want to be far away from any forest. I know that the media and law enforcement won't believe my story, but I recently heard about this subreddit from my girlfriend. She's the only one I've told this story to since then. She's the only one who believes me. She encouraged that I post this here. I think she hopes it will be therapeutic for me. But I decided to post this story because I want to warn anyone who will listen. Watch out for the forests. There are things out in those deep woods far beyond human comprehension. Whatever I saw in that forest, I have no doubt there's more out there. I remember what it said to Lydda. It mentioned a war. It said it would come back. The people that go missing out in the forests, the strange things that happen, maybe there really isn't a logical explanation for all of it. So if you start to see animals that look wrong with those white eyes in a forest, Get out while you still have the chance, or they might just come for you next. I hope that my tale will serve as a warning to all of you who choose to listen to it. I haven't seen Lita or Briggs since that night. And I can only hope they're doing well wherever they are. While I still wonder what those things are that attacked that night, I'm too scared to really go looking for the answers I want. As far as I'm concerned, I hope I never have to step into another forest again. But another part of me has started to become less scared over the years. I feel angry for all the horrors those things brought on. They killed innocent and good people like those college kids and Hank. I want to know what they are. And I want to stop them. There's a state park a few hundred miles from me and I've seen increasing reports of animal attacks and missing persons there lately. Maybe I should go there and warn them before things go too far. Edit, I sat on the story I wrote for a week. I wasn't sure whether to post it or not after giving it more thought. Yesterday, I got a visit from someone I never thought I'd see again. 
I heard a knock on my apartment door and before me stood Lita. She didn't look like she'd aged a day since the last time I saw her. She looked like how she had when I first met her. Tanned caramel skin, piercing hazel green eyes, a petite figure, five foot nothing, and jet black hair. The only difference was that her hair had grown down to her waist and was tied back in a messy braid. She looked up at me with that intense expression of hers before offering me an amused smile. We need to talk, she said simply. Of course, I let her in. She just waltzed into my apartment like she owned the place and took a seat on my couch. Nice place you've got. A little plain. But you were always kind of a basic guy, huh? She said casually as she surveyed my apartment while I stared at her in disbelief. Then she motioned for me to take a seat in the armchair across from her. In dumbfounded silence, I just did what she said. She's surprisingly good at getting others to follow her commands. That small figure just seems to exude authority when she wants it to. Well, I did promise you I'd explain everything. And, I'm finally here to uphold that promise. After I explained. I've got a favor to ask, she said. I just stared at her in response for a long moment before finally just sputtering a stuttered okay, Little laughed. Always so good with words huh Jack? She teased. That's my name by the way. Lita continued on to first tell me that her name isn't actually Lita. Navina is her name. So Lita, now Navina, continued on to explain just what happened in the forest that night and just who she really is. According to Navina, she comes from a long line of monster hunters. What we encountered in the forest five years ago was a parasitic species that can take over organic creatures that are controlled by one hive mind which, in this case, had taken the form of that coyote. They come from another world and showed up on Earth about 200 years ago. They're a species that tries to colonize worlds and consume whatever they get in contact with. But, Navina's group has been able to keep them at bay. They've taken to calling the species Weber since they trapped their victims in that spider web like substance and the parasite looks somewhat like a spider when removed from the host. And yes, Navina and I agreed the name wasn't the best. But it's what stuck. The Weber is a much larger creature that separates itself into smaller creatures which will then take over a host. They believe there are multiple Webers from whatever world it is they come from, but they don't know how many. They also don't actually know how the Webers get here. Thus far there are five Webers who have attempted to invade Earth and only one of them has made repeat attempts. There have been 15 invasion attempts in the last 200 years. Whether that means they killed the other Webers when they stopped them, they don't know. They just know this one particular Weber they've taken to calling Ba, for big asshole Weber, is the one who keeps coming back. Navina says that her people need to start coming up with better names. The Webers will take one primary host body on Earth and then extend their control outwards into other creatures by trapping them and feeding them its black blood so that the body becomes suitable for habitation. Then they will eventually turn into the warped creatures I saw five years ago. I angrily asked Navina why she didn't warn Hank and me about Abigail then and she just sadly stated that she couldn't alert the Weber that she was onto its game. She thought maybe there was still time to save Abigail since there have been cases where people in the process of becoming hosts have been able to be saved. She regretted what happened to Hank and that she couldn't save him. She explained that night was a train wreck and that she was supposed to have reinforcements come much earlier but due to extenuating circumstances they hadn't been able to arrive on time. Navina explained that her mother had been killed by the same Weber she fought that night. Then she proceeded to nonchalantly drop that she was able to fight Ba so efficiently because she's not human. No, in fact she's a half-demon. She had to use a spell that suppressed her demonic abilities while she worked at the state park so Ba wouldn't detect her and the effects of the spell had finally worn off when we were trapped in the cave system. She only laughed at my dumbstruck expression, shrugged, and said that her mom had weird and kind of bad taste since her dad had never really been around anyway. She'd been raised mostly by her grandpa, who was in fact Briggs. Surprise surprise, that's not his real name either. 
So the man, who was really named Bristian, left weeks earlier to get enough reinforcements to come back and deal with Ba when the signs had started showing up that another invasion was coming. But, as you all already know, he didn't get back until everything had already gone to havoc. If I ever see him again he and I have some things to talk about. Navina explained to me that not only are there Webers, demons, and magic. Apparently, there's a good many things that are real, like vampires, werewolves, angels, fey, and dragons. Among many other things. I'll really need to ask her more about that later. She sped over that whole point as she explained that her organization were people who kept the peace and stopped the bad guys who threatened the balance as she calls it. Can't say their name unfortunately top secret and all that. She tells me that her group in the organization is looking for new members. They need reinforcement since it's looking like that state park I've noticed may be the site of a new invasion. Well, I'll cut to the chase. I said yes. I've got an opportunity to do something against those bastards and do some good. So, I'm going to take it. Navina's standing behind me now while I write this. She's very amused by how I describe her. She's also told me to stop treating her like a kid since she's over a hundred years old. That leaves me with a lot more questions I need to ask her later. But I've got a lot I'm still trying to process. So, one step at a time there. Agreeing to join this organization means that I'm leaving everything behind now. I don't like the idea of leaving my girlfriend behind, but I know she wouldn't understand all of this or why I feel I need to help Navina and her people. After I finish writing this I'll be packing my things and making what preparations I need before I set out with Navina. My parting words to all of you are to be vigilant. There are many strange things in this world that we write off as nothing but fantasy. But what many of us forget is that there are many things we don't know about this world. Better to keep a watchful eye than be caught off guard if you do encounter something hidden from the majority of the world. With that, I thank you all for reading my story and I hope that you heed its warnings. What happened in that park to the people like Hank and Abigail was a tragedy. Hopefully I can do something to now save people like them. I grew up in Central Oregon, and there's a reservation called Warm Springs about two or so hours from where I lived. I only mention that because a lot of people in my area have friends there. And a lot of the land in that area belongs to that tribe. When I was a kid, we used to go camping up there. Not on the Rees, of course, but in that area, and I met a lot of kids who grew up there. I got to know one kid really well, his name was Nolan, and we ended up hanging out a lot when our families were in the area. Our folks got to know each other so we'd all get in touch and camp out around the same time. We'd camp for about two weeks, so we were out there for a long time. I asked him if he camped in an RV, yeah, my dad had one, so I guess it wasn't really camping but we'd take our tents and stuff and set them up out away from camp most nights. I didn't like sleeping in there because I like being outside. We talked for a bit about camping. So anyway, sorry, one year Nolan and I were out there, I think we must have been like 12 or so. We wanted to go out and camp near the river because we wanted to try night fishing, I think we must have been about a third of a mile from the main camp. Far enough away that we couldn't hear or see anyone else, I remember that. We were messing around most of the day, I don't really remember much about it, but we ended up building a fire at some point and I was really impressed because he had this flint or something that he used to start it. I'd never seen anyone do that before so I thought it was pretty cool. I got him to teach me how to do it and we lit some stuff on fire, which looking back was really stupid because it was the middle of summer, and if I remember right the fire warning was either at yellow or orange. But thankfully we didn't start anything major, and when it got dark we sat around and talked about whatever it is 12 year olds talk about, I don't really remember. What I do remember is that at some point, he looked over my shoulder at the river and asked me if I could see something. The way our camp was set up, we were about 10 feet from the river, and we were at the widest point, so it was probably about 20 feet to the other bank. It gets hot up there in the summer but the water's still cold, which is important. 
I look over my shoulder and I could see something wading into the river on the other side. From where we were it looked like a deer but we couldn't really tell because of the fire. I got up to look closer and I saw a pair of antlers, so I figured it was a buck. But I thought it was weird that it was wading into the water, and it was definitely heading for us, and I asked Nolan what he thought we should do. He's looking at the fire with this weird expression and he tells me to sit down and shut up, so I do, because I'd never seen him act that way before. He's whispering at me to ignore it, and to just keep talking like we were but I couldn't think of anything to say. He was saying something about an episode of some show, but I could hear the deer coming through the water, so I wasn't really paying any attention, and I kept trying to see over his shoulder, but every time I did he'd sort of hit me on the arm and make me look at him. I wasn't really scared, I remember, I was just sort of confused. But then I hear the deer come out of the water, and I could kind of make out what it looked like, and I realized it wasn't a deer because whatever it was was walking on two legs. I started to get up, I was super freaked out, but Nolan just yanked me back down and talked louder about this television show, and I could tell he was just as scared as I was, probably even more. He leaned in and poked the fire with a stick, and he whispered that whatever I do, I can't speak to it. I could see it come closer, and it stood right behind Nolan's back. I was about ready to pee my pants, and I think I'd probably have run if I'd been alone, but I didn't want to leave Nolan so I kept sitting really still and sneaking glances at it. It wasn't that tall, but the way it carried itself was just wrong, like its center of balance was screwed up. I can't really describe it, but it was kind of like it kept shifting too far forward. It just stood there behind Nolan for a long time, and eventually Nolan ran out of things to say and we just kind of sat there for a second. The fire was making noise, but I thought I could hear this thing talking in a really low voice. I couldn't hear what it was saying, and I leaned forward a tiny little bit, and I actually DIDP my pants when it leaned forward too. I couldn't see its face, but I saw its eyes. They were cloudy and milky, and if you want to know what they look like, find that scene from Lord of the Rings where Frodo falls in that lake and all the dead people are floating toward him. That's what its eyes looked like. So all I saw were these two white eyes floating above Nolan's head, and the really vague shape of the antlers coming out of its head. I don't know what my face looked like but at exactly the same time Nolan and I booked it out of there, and we ran non-stop until we got back to the main camp. My pants were soaked with pee, so I took them off as we were running and threw them in the bushes. We both stopped once we were in front of my dad's RV and we couldn't see anything chasing us, so we stood there and caught our breath. I asked him what that thing was but he said he didn't know. He said his grandpa had only warned him that if anything ever came up to him when he was out in the desert, he was never, ever supposed to talk to it or listen to anything it had to say. I wanted to know if he'd heard it talking to, and he said that the only thing he'd been able to understand was help you. I think we ended up sleeping in the RV with my parents, and the next night we went back out and didn't see anything. We were having dinner in town, five of us including myself. This guy, he was repainting an information booth and heard a man ask him for directions to the nearest campsite. He didn't turn around because he was up on a ladder, but he informed the man that there weren't any campsites nearby, but that if he headed down the road about four miles, he'd find one at another park. He asked if he could be of any other help, but the man said no and thanked him. My friend said he kept painting but he was listening and never heard the man leave. The second he came up and talked to me, the hairs on my neck stood up, but I wasn't sure why. I just had this really uneasy feeling about the whole thing, and I wanted to finish painting and get out of there. I figured maybe part of it was that I couldn't turn around to look at him, but something just felt off. There was also this weird smell floating around even before the guy talked to me, kind of like old period blood. I had looked around to see what was causing it but I didn't find anything. So I waited for the guy to walk away, but I didn't hear him leave, which made me think he was just standing there and watching me, so I asked again if I could do anything for him, and he didn't answer. I knew he was there though, because I hadn't heard him leave, so I did this awkward turn on the ladder to look down and see what he was doing. 
Now I admit it could have just been my brain mess up, but I swear to you, Russ, for a split second when I turned around, that man didn't have a face. Like he had no face. It was almost concave, and totally smooth, and I just about had a heart attack because I couldn't even wrap my brain around what I was seeing. I think I started to say something but there was this kind of pop inside my head and suddenly he was just a normal looking guy. I must have looked weird because he asked me if I was okay, and I was just like yeah, I'm fine. He asks about the campsite again and I point to where he has to go, and he's like I'm not from around here, can you help me get there? Now this is when I know something is really up because there's no way this guy got out here and didn't know where he was. And for that matter, there's no car around, so how did he get here in the first place? I said I was sorry but that I couldn't take him anywhere in a company vehicle, and he's like please? I really don't know where I am, can you come with me and help me get there? So now I'm seriously weirded out, and I start wondering if this is some kind of ambush or whatever. I told him I could call him a taxi to come out and take him where he wants to go, and I pull out my phone and he just goes no and walks away really quickly. But he doesn't walk out of the park, he walks back into the trees and I got right in my truck and start to get out of there, the paint or whatever. I looked in my mirror to see where he was as I was leaving and he was standing right at the tree line again, I don't know how he got there so fast, but this time I know that he didn't have a face. He was just watching me leave, and right before I turned the corner he took a big step back into the trees and kind of dissolved, I guess. Maybe it was just dark so he blended in, but it felt more like he just melted away. Interestingly, right after this guy finished his story, someone else, piped up with another one, but with a slightly different twist. You know actually, I had something sort of weird like that happen a while back. I was out doing some trail scouting, and I was out in the middle of nowhere figuring out where we were gonna have this trail run through. I hadn't seen anyone else for probably a good two hours, so I wasn't really paying attention to where I was going, I was just looking at the ground for the most part. Then out of nowhere, I crested this little hill and almost ran into this guy. He was older, probably in his 60s, and I started to apologize to him for running into him. And then I noticed his face, and I probably looked like a complete douchebag because I stopped and just stared at him. It took me a second to figure out what was wrong, but this guy's face was huge. I know that sounds weird, but that's the only way I can describe it. His head wasn't big or anything, it was normal, but the amount of space his face took up was just way too much. Like if you took someone's face and enlarged it all by about two times. He doesn't say anything, he just kind of looks at me, and I backed up and was kind of stuttering and saying I was sorry, and I went around him and got out of there and did what I needed to do. The whole time, I kept looking behind me because I was so freaked out that he'd pop up behind me or something. I know it sounds ridiculous but I swear to you it was one of the creepiest things I've ever seen. I switched the topic to the stairs a little later, and there was a definite shift in enthusiasm. No one spoke up at first, there is a real stigma around discussing them, even when we're away from work. But I broke the ice with a story of my own, and the guy who told the story about the faceless man told this one, albeit very quietly. Couple years ago, I was camping with my girlfriend, and we're out about two miles from the road at this site I know. We went to bed that night, but we couldn't sleep because someone interjected a funny comment, and we were dangerously close to going off on another subject, but I got us back on track. Yeah, really funny, you. No, it was because we kept hearing that grinding noise. My brother used to grind his teeth in his sleep, and it kind of reminds me of that. My girlfriend was freaking out but I just kept telling her to ignore it because I've heard it before and you just have to ignore it. It goes away eventually, you guys know what I mean. We all knew what he meant. So eventually I got her to go to sleep, but I woke up probably two hours later because something was just off. I rolled over and she wasn't there, and I kind of freaked out, because... He thought for a second and then he took a very long drink. Anyway, I ran out of the tent calling her name, but I didn't have to go far. She was standing at the edge of the camp looking at something in the trees and I could see she was really pale. The fire was low but bright enough to see her. 
Anyway, so I ran up to see what was going on and she was dead asleep, but her eyes were open. She had this real spaced out look, you know. So I put my arm around her to lead her back, but she wouldn't move. She just said really quietly something like I have to go now, Eddie. I have to go, it's here. I was like you were just sleepwalking, come back to bed but she wouldn't budge. She just kept standing there and saying that she had to go. And I looked where she was looking, and there was a staircase right there about 15 yards away. Gray one, concrete. And she started to walk toward it but I yanked her back and that woke her up. She looked at me like I was out of my mind, and she asked what she was doing out of the tent. I didn't tell her anything, I just told her she was sleepwalking. The grinding was gone, so she just went back to the tent with me and fell asleep again. I don't know. I don't like thinking about it, you know? We all knew. You guys remember that kid with. I can't remember what it was, some kind of brain mess up, not downs but something like it. Someone else brought up. Well I got to read the report he gave when they found him a week after he went missing and it was beyond belief. I mean you have to take it with a grain of salt because who knows what that kid actually thinks is real, but some of this stuff, I don't think he could have made up. Like what? Well first of all, he talked about the stairs. He said he'd been watching his dad build a fire and the stairs came up to him, and he had to go up them or something bad would happen. The cops couldn't really understand what he was talking about after that, because he just kept saying like the campfire over and over. And he kept mentioning sounds, but he couldn't say what sounds, just that it was loud, and he covered his ears so he couldn't hear them. But the thing I remember most is that they asked him where exactly he'd gone, and he just said he was right there. He kept pointing at himself, and they said they thought that meant that he thought he'd never left. He said he wasn't scared because the stairs were there and he said they talked to him, but not like people talk. Like I said, it was really convoluted and hard to understand, and I have a feeling the cops didn't take most of it down. They ended up just saying that the kid had some kind of amnesia or fugue, and that they didn't think foul play was involved. Doesn't really explain why he came back a week later perfectly fine without a speck of dirt on him and well fed, but hey, what the cops say goes. I wasn't sure where else to post these stories, so I figured I'd share them here. I've been an SAR officer for a few years now, and along the way I've seen some things that I think you guys will be interested in. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time they just wander off the path, or slip down a small cliff, and they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard the old stay where you are thing, and they don't wander far. But I've had two cases where that didn't happen. Both bother me a lot, and I use them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together, and both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for a few seconds, and in that time both the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us, and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly, and when we asked where her brother was, she told us that he'd been taken away by the bear man. She said he gave her berries and told her to stay quiet, that he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was also insistent that he wasn't a normal man, but that he was tall and covered in hair, like a bear, and that he had a weird face. We searched that area for weeks, it was one of the longest calls I've ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandpa. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she'd never come back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name, before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere, and we never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could possibly have gone, because neither her mother or grandpa saw her come down. A few times, I've been out on my own searching with a canine, and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs. Not hills, not even rock faces. 
straight, sheer cliffs with no possible handholds. It's always baffling, and in those cases we usually find the person on the other side of the cliff, or miles away from where the canine has led us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particularly sad case involved the recovery of a body. A nine-year-old girl fell down an embankment and got impaled on a dead tree at the base. It was a complete freak accident, but I'll never forget the sound her mother made when we told her what had happened. She saw the body bag being loaded into the ambulance, and she let out the most haunting, heartbroken wail I've ever heard. It was like her whole life was crashing down around her, and a part of her had died with her daughter. I heard from another SAR officer that she killed herself a few weeks after it happened. She couldn't live with the loss of her daughter. I was teamed up with another SAR officer because we'd received reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip when he was supposed to, and we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get to where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevasse with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He'd been there for almost two days, and his leg was very obviously infected. We were able to get him into a chopper, and I heard from one of the EMTs that the guy was absolutely inconsolable. He kept talking about how he'd been doing fine, and when he'd gotten to the top, a man had been there. He said the guy had no climbing equipment, and he was wearing a parka and ski pants. He walked up to the guy, and when the guy turned around, he said he had no face. It was just blank. He freaked out and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast, which is why he'd fallen. He said he could hear the guy all night, climbing down the mountain and letting out these horrible muffled screams. That story bothered the hell out of me. I'm glad I wasn't there to hear it. One of the scariest things I've ever had happened to me involved the search for a young woman who'd gotten separated from her hiking group. We were out until late at night, because the dogs had picked up her scent. When we found her, she was curled up under a large rotted log. She was missing her shoes and pack, and she was clearly in shock. She didn't have any injuries, and we were able to get her to walk with us back to base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us and asking us why that big man with black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we just wrote it off as some weird symptom of shock. But the closer we got to base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest, saying that she wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said, and she wouldn't give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, but we started hearing these weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but more rhythmic and deeper. It was almost insect-like, I don't really know how else to describe it. When we were within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me and her eyes are about as wide as I can imagine a human could open them. She touches my shoulder and says he says to tell you to speed up. He doesn't like looking at the scar on your neck. I have a very small scar on the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar, and I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she says it, I hear that weird coughing right in my ear, and I just about jumped out of my skin. I hustled her to ops, trying not to show how freaked out I was, but I have to say I was really happy when we left the area that night. This is the last one I'll tell, and it's probably the weirdest story I have. Now, I don't know if this is true in every SAR unit, but in mine, it's sort of an unspoken, regular thing we run into. You can try asking about it with other SAR officers, but even if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by our superiors, and at this point we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't even seem weird anymore. On just about every case where we're really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took the stairs in your house, cut them out and put them in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told, very emphatically, that I should never go near any of them. 
I just sort of ignore them now when I run into them because it happens so frequently. As far as missing persons go, I'd say about half the calls I get are related to that. The others are rescue calls, people who fall down cliffs and hurt themselves, that injured by fire, you wouldn't believe how often this happens, mostly drunk kids, get bitten or stung by animals or insects. We're a tight team, and we have veterans who are excellent at finding signs of lost people. That's what makes these cases where we never find any trace of them so frustrating. One in particular was upsetting for all of us, because we did find a trace of them but it just led to more questions than answers. An older man had been hiking alone on a well-established trail, but his wife called to say that he hadn't come home when he should have. Apparently he had a history of seizures, and she was worried that he hadn't taken his medication and had suffered one out on the trail. Before you ask, I have no idea why he thought it was okay to go out alone, or why she didn't go with him. I don't ask about that kind of thing because past a certain point, it really doesn't matter someone is missing, and it's my job to find them. We went out in a standard search formation, and it wasn't long before one of our vets found signs that the guy had gone off the trail. We grouped up and followed him, spreading out in a fan to make sure we were covering as much ground as possible. Suddenly, a call comes over the radio telling us to all head back to the vet's location, and we come right away, because this usually means the missing person is injured, and we need a full team to help get them out safely. We meet back up, and the vet is just standing at the base of a tree with his hands on the sides of his head. I ask my buddy what's going on, and he points up into the branches of this tree. I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing, but there's a walking stick dangling from a branch at least 30 feet off the ground. The little strap thing on the handle has been looped around the branch, and it's just hanging there. There's no way the guy could have tossed it up that far, and we don't see any other signs that he's still in the area. We call up into the tree, but it's obvious no one's in it. We're all just sort of left scratching our heads. We keep searching for the guy, but we never find him. We even bring our canines out, but they lose his scent long before this tree. Eventually, the search is called off, because there are other calls we have to attend to, and past a certain point there's not much we can do. The guy's wife called us every day for months, asking if we'd found her husband, and it was heartbreaking to hear her get more and more hopeless each time. I'm not sure why this call in particular was so upsetting, but I think it was just the sheer improbability of it. That and the questions that were raised. How the hell had this guy's cane ended up there? Did someone kill him and toss that up there as some weird trophy? We did our best to find him, but it was almost like a taunt. We still talk about that one from time to time. Missing kids are the most heartbreaking. Doesn't matter what circumstances they go missing under, it's never easy, and we always, always dread the ones we find deceased. It's not common, but it does happen. David Polite talks a lot about kids' SAR teams find in places they shouldn't be, or couldn't be. I can honestly say I've heard about this kind of thing happening more than I've seen it, but I'll share one of the ones that I think about a lot that I witnessed personally. A mother and her three kids were out for a picnic in an area of the park that has a small lake. One is six, one is five, and the other is about three. She's watching them all really closely, and according to her, she never lets them out of her sight at any time. She never saw anyone else in the area either, which is important. She packs their stuff up and they start to head back to the parking area. Now, this lake is only about two miles into the woods, and it's on a very clearly established trail. It's almost impossible to get lost getting from the parking area to it, unless you're deliberately going off the path like an imbecile. Her kids are walking in front of her, when she hears what sounds like someone coming up the path behind her. She turns around, and in the four or so seconds she's not looking, her five-year-old son vanishes. She figures he stepped off the trail to pee or something, and she asks her other two where he went. They both tell her that a big man with a scary face came out of the woods next to them, took the kid's hand, and led him into the trees. The two remaining kids don't seem upset, in fact she says later that it seems like they've been drugged. They're sort of spacey and fuzzy. So of course, she freaks out, starts looking frantically in the area for her kid. She's screaming his name, and she says at one point she thinks she heard him answer her. 
Now obviously she can't go blindly running into the woods, she's got the other two kids, so she calls the police and they send us out immediately. We respond, and we start the search for him. Over the course of this search, which spans miles, we never find a single trace of the kid. Canines can't pick up any scent, we don't find any clothing or broken bushes or literally anything that would signify a child being there. Of course there's suspicion about the mother for a while, but it's pretty clear that she's completely destroyed by the whole thing. We looked for this kid for weeks, with a lot of volunteer help. But eventually, the search peters out, and we have to move on. The volunteers keep searching, though, and one day we get a call on the radio letting us know that a body has been found and needs to be recovered. They tell us the location, and none of us can believe it. We figure it has to be a different kid. But we go out there, about 15 miles from the site where he vanished, and sure enough, we find the body of the kid we've been looking for. I have been trying to figure out how this kid got where he did ever since we found him, and I've never come up with an answer. A volunteer just happened to be in the area, because he figured he might as well look in places no one else would think to on the off chance the body had been dumped. He comes to the base of a tall, rocky slope, and halfway up, he sees something. He looks through his binoculars, and sure enough, it's the body of a little boy stuffed in a little opening in the rock. He recognizes the color of the kid's shirt, so he knows right away that it's the missing boy. That's when he calls it in, and we're dispatched. It took us almost an hour to get his body down, and none of us could believe what we were seeing. Not only was this kid 15 miles from where he'd started, there was no possible way he could have gotten up there on his own. This slope is treacherous, and it's hard even for us with our climbing gear. A five-year-old boy had no way of getting up there, of that I'm certain. Not only that, but the kid doesn't have a scratch on him. His shoes are gone, but his feet aren't damaged or dirty. So it wasn't as if an animal dragged him up there. And from what we can tell, he hasn't been dead that long. He'd been out there over a month by that point, and it looked like he'd only been dead for, at most, a day or two. The whole thing was unbelievably strange, and was one of the most disconcerting calls I've ever been on. We found out later that the coroner determined the kid had died from exposure. He'd frozen to death, probably late at night two days before we found him. There were no suspects, and no answers. To date, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. One of my first jobs as a trainee was a search op for a four-year-old kid that had gotten separated from his mom. This was one of those cases where we knew we were gonna find him because the dogs were on a strong scent trail, and we saw clear signs that he was in the area. We ended up finding him in a berry patch about half a mile from where he'd been last seen. Kid wasn't even aware that he'd wandered that far. One of the vets brought him back, which I was glad for because I'm really not good with kids, and I find it hard to talk to them and keep them company. As my trainer and I are headed back, she decides to take me on a detour to show me one of the hot spots where we tend to find missing people. It's a natural dip in the land near a popular trail, and people will usually move downhill because it's easier. We hike out there, it's a few miles away, and we get there in about an hour or so. As we're walking around the area and she's pointing out places she's found people in the past, I see something in the distance. Now, this area we're in is about 8 miles from the main parking area, though there's back roads you can take to get closer if you don't want to hike that far. But we're on state protected land, which means there can't be any kind of commercial or residential development out here. The most you'll ever see is a fire tower or makeshift shelter that homeless people think they can get away with building. But I can see from here that whatever this thing is has straight edges, and if there's one thing you learn quickly, it's that nature rarely makes straight lines. I point it out, but she doesn't say anything. She just hangs back and lets me wander over and check it out. I get within about 20 feet of it, and all the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It's a staircase in the middle of the fucking woods. In the proper context, it would literally be the most benign thing ever. It's just a normal staircase, with beige carpet, and about 10 steps tall. But instead of being in a house, where it obviously should be, it's out here in the middle of the woods. The sides aren't carpeted, obviously, and I can see the wood it's made of. 
It's almost like a video game glitch, where the house has failed to load completely and the stairs are the only thing visible. I stand there, and it's like my brain is working overtime to try and make sense of what I'm seeing. My trainer comes and stands next to me, and she just stands there casually, looking at it as if it's the least interesting thing in the world. I ask her what the fuck this thing is doing here, and she just chuckles. Get used to it, rookie. You're gonna see a lot of them. I start to move closer, but she grabs my arm. Heart. I wouldn't do that. She says. Her voice is casual, but her grip is tight, and I just stand there looking at her. You are gonna see them all the time, but don't go near them. Don't touch them, don't go up them. Just ignore them. I start to ask her about it, but something in the way she's looking at me tells me that it's best if I don't. We end up moving on, and the subject doesn't come up again for the rest of my training. She was right, though. I'd say about every fifth call I go on, I end up running across a set of stairs. Sometimes they're relatively close to the path, maybe within two or three miles. Sometimes they're 20, 30 miles out, literally in the middle of nowhere, and I only find them during the broadest searches or training weekends. They're usually in good condition, but sometimes it looks like they've been out there for miles. All different kinds, all different sizes. The biggest I ever saw looked like they came out of a turn of the century mansion, and were at least 10 feet wide, with steps leading up at least 15 or 20 feet. I've tried talking about it with people, but they just give me the same response my trainer did. It's normal. Don't worry about it, they're not a big deal, but don't go close to them or up them. When trainees ask me about it now, I give them the same response. I don't really know what else to tell them. I'm really hoping someday I get a better answer, but it hasn't happened yet. This is another one that was less spooky and more sad. A young man went missing late in winter, when realistically no one should be going that far out onto the trails. We close a lot of them, but some remain open year round, unless there's a shitload of snow. We did an op for him, but we had about six feet of snow on the ground, it was an unusually heavy snow year, and we knew it wasn't likely that we'd find him until spring when the thaw came. Sure enough, when the first big thaw came, a hiker reported a body a little ways off the main trail. We found him at the base of a tree, in a pile of melted snow. I knew right away what had happened, and it scared the living shit out of me. Most of you who ski or snowboard, or spend any amount of time on a mountain, will probably have guessed too. When snow falls, it doesn't collect as thick in the areas beneath the branches. It happens most with fir trees, because they have a sort of closed umbrella shape. So what you end up with is a space around the base of a tree that's filled with a mixture of loose, powdery snow, air, and branches. They're called tree wells, and they're not immediately obvious if you don't know what you're looking for. We put up signs in the welcome center, big ones, letting people know how dangerous they are, but every year that we get an unusual amount of snow, at least one person doesn't read them, or doesn't take the warning seriously and we find out about it in spring. My best guess is that this young man was hiking and got tired, or maybe a cramp from walking in the deep snow. He went to go sit at the base of the tree, not knowing that there was a tree well, and fell in. He got stuck with his feet up, and the surrounding snow caved in around him. Unable to free himself, he suffocated. It's called snow immersion suffocation, and it doesn't usually happen except in really deep snow. But if you get stuck in a weird position, like this guy did, even six feet of snow can be lethal. What scared me the most was imagining how he must have struggled. Upside down, in the freezing cold, he didn't die quickly. The snow would have formed a dense, heavy pile on top of him, and it would have been literally impossible to get out. As it got harder to breathe, he would have known what was happening. I can't even imagine what he was thinking in his last moments. A lot of my less outdoorsy friends want to know if I've ever seen the goat man while I've been out on calls. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I've never had anything quite like that happen. I guess the closest was the whole black eyed man thing, but I didn't see anything. However, there was one call where I had something kind of similar happen, but I'm not sure I'm willing to chalk it up to the goat man. 
We'd gotten a report that an older woman had fainted along one of the trails, and needed assistance getting back down to the main area. We hike up to where she's at, and her husband is just beside himself. He runs, well, I guess more jogs, to us, and tells us that he was a little ways off the trail looking at something when his wife starts screaming behind him. He runs back to her and she's passed out on the trail. We get her on a backboard, and as we're getting her down to the welcome center, she comes to and starts screaming again. I calm her down and ask her what happened. I can't remember verbatim what she said, but essentially, what happened was this, she'd been waiting for her husband when she started hearing this really strange sound. She said it sounded sort of like a cat, but it was off somehow, and she couldn't quite figure out why. She went a little ahead to try and hear it better, and it sounded like it was coming closer. She said the closer it got, the more uneasy she was, until she finally figured out what was wrong. I do remember this next part, because it was so weird that I don't think I could forget it if I tried. It wasn't a cat. It was a man, saying the word meow over and over. Just meow, meow, meow. But it wasn't a man, it couldn't have been, because I've never heard a man make his voice buzz like that. I thought my hearing aid was going out, but it wasn't, I adjusted it and it still sounded all buzzy. It was awful. He was coming closer, but I couldn't see him. And the closer he got the more scared I was, and the last thing I remember was a shape coming out of the trees. I guess that's when I fainted. Now, obviously I'm a little perplexed as to why a guy would be out in the woods chanting meow, meow at people. So once we get down the mountain, I tell my superior that I'm gonna go search the area to see if I can find anything. He gives me the go-ahead, and I grab a radio and hike back to where she fainted. I don't see anyone, so I keep going about a mile more, and I when I head back I go off the trail, to see if I can figure out where she saw him coming from. It's almost sunset by this point, and I don't have any desire to be out at night alone, so I just sort of write it off and make a mental note to check it out again tomorrow. But as I'm headed back, I start to hear something in the distance. I stop, and I call out for anyone in the immediate area to identify themselves. The sound didn't come closer or get louder, but it sounded exactly like a man saying meow, meow in this really odd monotone. As comical as it makes it sound, it was almost like that guy on South Park with the electrolarynx, Ned. I go off the trail in the direction I think it's coming from, but I never seem to get closer. It's almost like it's coming from all directions. Eventually, it just sort of fades out, and I ended up going back to the welcome center. I didn't get any further reports like that, and even though I went back to that area, I never heard that exact sound again. I suppose it could have been some stupid kid out there messing with people, but even I have to admit it was weird. I was working as a forest ranger. Something is following me now. I always liked the quietness of nature, the peace that comes with waking through the trees and into the woods. Also, watching the clear night sky is a very nice thing to do when out in the forest. Seeing so many stars just remind me of how small we really are. How insignificant is our existence, we could disappear in an instant and the universe wouldn't even notice. My brother always brought me with him when he went camping, and that's when I discovered my passion for nature. Now, I just like to go hiking or camping with my friends, as my brother has moved out of the country. I hope I will see him soon, I really miss spending time with him. I'm worried I won't have the privilege of doing that, given the situation I find myself in now. But hope is all I've got. If you read this, please pray for me. I need that. I won't give specific details about me, as I don't consider them important. I'm a 26 years old man. That's the most I'm saying. I will tell you how I got in this situation. I recently started to work as a forest ranger. Everything seemed okay at first, but the fact that they just took me without any interview should have rang some alarm bells. I was desperate for a job as I have very little money, so I never thought about it. The day I arrived at the cabin was beautiful. The sun was setting, leaving off a dim orange light going through the trees. The weather was nice, you know, your typical clear summer weather. Everything was perfect. 
The cabin is almost entirely made out of wood. Classic, I thought. It's big enough for one or two persons, and it looks very cozy inside. I stepped through the door and put my backpack underneath the bed. I opened the wardrobe and put on my sleeping clothes. As I got comfortable, I noticed there was a piece of paper on the table, along with a survival guide and a metal crucifix. Something was wrong. I picked up the note, and something felt very off about it. I could feel the blood running cold in my veins as I started to read it. Hello, my name is Killian Sutter and I am the former ranger who worked here. I don't want to scare you, but this job is not as you would expect. You see, weird things happen here, and they can prove to be deadly if you don't follow carefully what I tell you. In order to be able to survive, this note will be your Bible. The rules I have written for you are things I discovered on my own while working here. I don't know if this is everything but, it's mostly what usually happens here. 1. If the light bulb in your cabin suddenly starts to flicker, lock the door immediately, close the curtains and turn off the lights. The thing will come close to your cabin and will try to enter. Do not panic, as it will leave if it doesn't find a way in. 2. Always lock the door behind you when you go outside. Failing to do this will result in the thing waiting for you in the cabin, hidden somewhere. 3. If you hear scratching coming from outside the cabin, do not be tricked by your ears. It's not coming from outside, but from inside. Stay still and hold your breath. The thing is blind, and it won't know you are there if you do that. It should leave by the time you can count to 10, rushing through the door. 4. While outside, be as quiet as you can, or it will hear you. If it does, rush back to the cabin and barricade yourself in there. 5. If at any point you get injured, clean the wound fast and bandage it so that you can't see any blood. The thing can smell blood from far away and it makes it go into a feral frenzy. Also, change the bandage often. When you do that, throw the old bandage in the fire. 6. Never leave your cabin after the sunset and before the sunrise, no matter what. The thing is much more aggressive when it's dark outside. 7. Before you go to sleep, put the metal crucifix I left you in a direction facing the entrance to the cabin. 8. Set your alarm at 3 a.m. and wake up to check on the crucifix. If it has blood on it, ignore rule number 6 and get out of the cabin as fast as you can run to the storm shelter. I have marked it for you on the map in the survival guide. 9. Don't try to escape the woods until your contract expires, or the thing will follow you wherever you go. You have been warned. Some situations will require you to combine the rules, so be sure to remember them all. Good luck. And keep yourself safe. No. What did I get into? Thoughts rushed aggressively through my mind, I was both angry and confused at the same time. I didn't know if the note was a prank or if it was real. Maybe this guy Killian just wanted to scare me but I'd rather not take any chances, and follow what is written on that piece of paper. At least until I realize if it's fake or not. When I got hired nobody told me that somebody left before I was about to get into this. Maybe they knew I wouldn't accept if they told me this. Soon after, it was dark outside. I was sleepy, and I almost forgot to put the crucifix to face the door. Then, I went to sleep. The next day, I woke up and noticed a big scratch on my right arm, I was bleeding. I quickly cleaned the wound and applied a bandage to it. I also threw my shirt and the stained bed sheets in the fire, because they had my blood on them. I froze then. How did this happen? Then I remembered the rule. Set your alarm at 3 AM and wake up to check on the crucifix. If it has blood on it, Ignore rule number 6 and get out of the cabin as fast as you can run to the storm shelter. I didn't check the crucifix. I have to admit, I was scared. The list of rules was not a prank. Killian knew something I didn't, and he wanted to warn me about it. I haven't seen this thing he was talking about in the note until now, but I'm sure I don't want to see it. Not after what happened today. I checked to see if the crucifix had blood on it. Yeah, I know. I should have done that hours earlier. It seemed to be fine. 
Why did I wake up with a big scratch on the arm then? What the hell is going on? I spent the rest of the day in my bed, afraid to get outside the cabin to check the woods. This night I followed the rules exactly as I should have the night before. I put the crucifix to face the door, and woke up at 3 in the morning to check on it. It was fine. The next five days were peaceful and I finally summoned the courage to do my actual job and go check the woods. I was quiet, and I didn't attract any unwanted attention. Those were the best days. I could actually enjoy being out in the nature, and relax for a while. I felt so disconnected from the troubles of my life, I felt a sensation of peace. It was almost like the rules never existed, apart from the night ones and the door locking one. I was out there enjoying myself. I didn't miss my normal days before I got the job. I enjoyed every last moment of those quiet days, and I'm glad I did because things started to get bad. On the eighth day I was inside the cabin, reading a book while I was in bed. And then, I've heard it. Scratching sounds were seemingly coming from outside. I remembered the rule. If you hear scratching coming from outside the cabin, do not be tricked by your ears. It's not coming from outside, but from inside. Stay still and hold your breath, it should leave by the time you count to 10. I quickly closed my eyes and stood frozen in the bed, holding my breath. I could feel the breath of the thing as it was sniffing me. I think it sensed the smell of fresh meat. A quick meal. I started to count. I was about to reach 10, when I heard a loud noise. The thing rushed out of the cabin through the door. I ran and closed it, locking it in the process. Then, I passed out on the floor. When I woke up, it was almost midnight. Oh, my God. The crucifix. I quickly rushed to put it in a position to face the door. Did I fail this rule? Am I going to die? These thoughts tormented me until 3 AM, when I checked it. My heart started to beat fast, so fast that it could tear my chest apart. The crucifix had blood on it. In a panic, I grabbed the survival guide and a flashlight and I booked it to the storm shelter. I could feel the thing following me, getting closer each moment. After a 15 minute run, I arrived at the storm shelter. I rushed through the door and locked it behind me. Then, I fell down from the pain I could feel in my left leg. I think I snapped my ankle trying to outrun the beast out there. I crawled in a corner and fell asleep, waking up before the sunrise from the aching pain in my left ankle. Then, I fell asleep again. As I woke up, I asked myself how am I going to make it back to the cabin with a snapped ankle. I improvised a waking stick out of a wooden pole in the storm shelter, and I started to hike back to the cabin. I had to get help. There is no mobile service in the forest and I don't have a landline in the cabin. Also, I'm not a doctor, and I can't do anything about my ankle. As I was walking around the forest, I could feel the thing from before was watching me, smiling at me. I was easy prey. I couldn't get away from it anymore. My heavy footsteps were leaving deep marks on the ground, as I was getting more and more tired. Finally, I got back to the cabin. I ate something, then I thought of something risky. I planned to leave the woods tomorrow. I knew it was stupid, and I also knew what would happen if I do that. It's written in the rules. I lost the flow of time while contemplating on my decision, and soon, it was dark outside again. I turned on the light, and soon it started to flicker. No, not now, I thought to myself. I checked to see if the door was locked, and sure enough, it was. I closed the curtains and turned off the light, as instructed. Shortly after, I could hear it. The thing was outside the cabin, trying to find a way in. It started to claw at the walls and smash its body on the door. I accidentally caught a glimpse of what the thing looked like through a small part of a window. It was tall, and it had pale skin, like it was made out of snow. You could see the veins in its skin, that's how pale it was. It had long limbs, and big razor-sharp claws. But the most terrifying thing was its head. It was human, but it was missing its eyes. It had big, dark and empty eye sockets, so dark you could stare into them and feeling a sensation of plunging into the abyss. 
I could feel the terrible hunger for human meat this creature had, and I was scared. It wanted to tear at me, rip out my flesh and feast on it. It would be just a matter of time until it gets me. After a while, it left and I went to put the crucifix to face the door. I also woke up at 3 am to check on it, and it was clean. My lucky night. I had to get some rest for tomorrow. I woke up the next day, and geared up to leave the forest once and for all. I exited the cabin, and started to hike towards the edge of the woods. I was slow, as I had to use the improvised walking stick from earlier. As I hadn't eaten for a long while, and I was gripped by agonizing hunger. I tripped over and fell to the ground. The noise was loud, loud enough to attract that thing to come to me. I saw it getting closer, grinning its teeth in anticipation. I was done for. Then, I heard something in the woods. A very loud growl was echoing through the trees, and it seemed to scare the thing from earlier. Then, came a beast similar to this one, running on all fours, and the two clashed in a fight. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The monster which came recently scared the other, which was running like a wounded animal back to the thick tree line. I could see the beast was wearing, a torn ranger uniform. Or the remains of it. On the badge, I could read the name of the wearer. It was written clear and big, Killian Sutter. The thing ran back into the woods, chasing the other beast. What did just happen? I was very confused, until I remember that Killian Sutter was also the name of the last ranger who worked in this forest. Why was he a beast? And why did he attack the other one? I'm grateful that I'm alive. I picked myself up and continued to hike out of the forest. I arrived at the road, and got into my car. I called 911, as I was injured, cold and afraid. I passed out after. I woke up in the bed of a hospital. There's something clawing at the door, and I know what happened. I broke the last rule. Don't try to escape the woods until your contract expires, or the thing will follow you wherever you go. Now I'm just sitting in the hospital bed, afraid of whatever got out of that forest and is now following me. I can sense its hunger. It wants my flesh. And I know that a door is not enough to stop it. As the hinge got looser and looser, I was preparing for the impending doom ahead. I accepted the fact that I'm going to die. But I got lucky again, as it left before the door was broken. I feel like it's playing with me. Preying on my fear. And it knows that I can't do much about it. As I'm writing this, I got discarded from the hospital and I'm sitting in my bed, at home. I know it's only a matter of time before I will see the creature. But this time, I won't run. I'm going to face whatever that is. I'm a park ranger, and in order to survive, I had to make my own rules. I've been a park ranger for a little under six months, and I almost quit in my first week. You see, I've always preferred being in nature as opposed to the city, mostly because I enjoy the quiet, and when I was a kid, watching Crocodile Hunter and other nature conservation shows and stories, I love animals. The things I've seen and had to deal with, though. I'm not sure they classify as even real. The first night I showed up to work, I arrived 10 minutes early, and little did I know at the time, it was the worst mistake I made on my first day. It's a small park, and it didn't need more than two rangers on site at a time, but most of the time we just had one. I was greeted by the ranger from the shift before on arrival and given the rundown of what I'd be doing that night, mostly just hanging out in the information building and monitoring trail and site cameras. Once every couple of hours in the 10-hour shift, I would patrol one of the four quadrants the park was divided into. What no one told me my first day, is that the night shift park ranger either goes missing or dies within the first week. I found this out later that night, and not from the first shift ranger. After the first two hours of monitoring cameras and helping the two people that stopped by the information center, I set out on patrol, choosing the quadrant I went to at random. In the end, I decided on the east quadrant, one of the more undisturbed areas of the park. 
I hopped in the sorry excuse for a patrol car, more like a buggy or ATV than a car, and headed towards the East Quadrant. It was a quiet drive for the most part, except for the sounds of crickets and occasional owl's hoot. But as I got closer to the East Quadrant, I noticed the sounds began to die away, slowly but surely, until all was silent. I preferred the quiet anyway, so the sounds dying away was less alarming than it was calming for me. I had a smile on my face as I began making my round. I expected not to find many, if any, campers in this section of the park. But about halfway through my patrol, I came across a bald man stumbling down the trail. I stopped the car a little ways away from him, weak headlights shining directly at him. I pulled out my flashlight and hopped out of the car, approaching the hobbling man. Excuse me, sir? Are you all right? You don't look that well. He had stopped dead in his tracks when I noticed him, but I hardly took notice of it as I approached. The only thing that struck me as strange was the fact that the man had his head tilted down, so a shadow cast across his face. He spoke with a speech impediment, he spoke slowly and deeply, and it sounded like his mouth was stuffed with bread. Ran. Gare, he hadn't moved a muscle, and I never saw his mouth open as he spoke, it struck me as odd and I stopped with a little bit of distance between us. The injured looking man hadn't moved at all since I spotted him. You must. Be the new. Ranger. I noticed a slight amount of movement in the shadows splayed across his face, and a small amount of noise, like something being sharpened or sliced. I found it odd that this man was able to identify me as the new ranger, but maybe he was just a regular to the park. I am. Do you need help? It's been. So long. Since I've had. A meal. Ran. Gare. Help. Me. I had brought along a few protein bars with me, wanting a snack for the shift, and I had brought some along as I didn't know how long the patrol would take. Come with me, back over to my patrol car. Have you been lost out here, sir? Do you need any assistance other than food? The strange man made no move to come closer, he just stood where I had first found him, stone still. I am. Only hungry. Ranger. I stared at him for a few more moments, before turning to walk back to my patrol car. Then come with me, I'll give you some protein bars, and after that, I think you should come with me. I trailed off because at that moment I felt and heard something behind me, breathing down my neck and breathing heavily. From behind, I heard, last mistake. You'll ever make. Ranger. Now. I can. Eat. I heard the snapping of bones from behind me as the strange man slammed into my back, winding me and knocking me to the ground. I tried to catch my breath and scramble up and towards my patrol car, but with surprising speed after such a forceful blow, the man put all of his weight onto my back. I heard a guttural sound coming from the man behind me and felt a slimy smattering of something wet drip onto and soak through my uniform. I had begun to recover from the blow to my back and noticed I still clutched the flashlight in my hand. I took in a sharp quick breath, bracing myself as I twisted and swung wildly, connecting with the butt of the flashlight to something, as his foot slid off my back. I took a look up at the man and noticed the most horrifying image I'd ever seen up to that point. His mouth hung open in the most inhuman way, and rows of long needle and saw-like teeth, the number of which was impossibly large. Drool dripped from his mouth and the sickly sweet smell of rotting flesh and death assaulted my nostrils. The man was posed like a tiger ready to pounce as I stared at him, but the longer I stared in horror at this monstrosity, the more I noticed he wouldn't move a muscle. The creature in front of me snarled as I began backing up slowly, scooting my way across the ground towards the patrol car. You got lucky this time. Ran, Gare. I'll get you. Next time. You come to. This place. Just like. The last. He made a noise, an unearthly noise like stones grinding together mixed with the call of a wild animal. Something about his face gave me the impression he was amused. Like he was laughing. I got to my feet and kept eye contact as I opened the door to my patrol car and climbed inside 
trembling and struggling to get the key into the ignition as I stared at the creature. I noticed he still didn't move if I blinked, so luckily I didn't have to strain my eyes, but multitasking and spatial awareness were already not my strong suit. I struggled for another 5 minutes before starting the patrol vehicle back up and I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, swerving around the man and trying to make my way around the circuit to get back to the information center. The haunting laughter of the creature followed me as it echoed throughout the forest. I feel like he let me go on purpose. It's like he got bored of easy kills, and now he wants to hunt me. I hastily completed the circuit and made it back to the information center. This thing had told me he had killed other rangers in the past, but there's no mention at all of anything like him in the park. So as soon as I made it back to the information center, I began to write out a list, a reminder for myself and the next ranger after I quit this place because at the time I convinced myself I was going to be able to quit. I took a sheet of printer paper from the machine and began writing, rules to survive the night shift. Rule 1, never break line of sight with the bald man with the strange lisp. If you do, pray he lets you go. I was still staring in disbelief at the printer paper in front of me after I wrote rule 1 down. I had thought at first a rational explanation had to be found for the man with the needle-like teeth. Perhaps some sort of paranoid delusion, or hallucination brought on by sleep deprivation, or something in the forest. But the aching pain in my back, along with the cuts from where he held me down, and the still wet and slimy saliva on my neck and uniform reminded me of how all too real it was. I was grateful I didn't have to return to the East Quadrant that night, and the trail cams never picked up Derek. At this time, I should tell you I came up with a name for him, I call him Derek, as his broken speech pattern reminded me of an alien character from a game I used to play as a kid. I never could pronounce his name correctly, so I called him Derek. The next couple of hours came and went much as the first couple, except no one came up to the information center, save one man. He was much too tall, so tall that when he came to the doorway, I couldn't see his face. He must have been around seven and a half feet tall. As I approached the door, he insisted we talk through the window grate, similar to ones used at movie theater ticket booths. This was honestly fine by me, as at the moment I didn't really feel like opening the door for anyone anyway. How could I help you this evening, sir? I asked through the grate to the overly tall man. He stood still for a moment before leaning down slightly, the only thing I could see of his face in the low light that glistened outside the window was his amber-colored eyes. Yes, I'm looking for the Willow campsite. Could you point me in the proper direction, Ranger? He spoke in a low voice and his speech was slow. He must have anxiety or something, I had initially thought to myself, so I put on a smile for him as I spoke, ah, uh, yeah, no problem. Head west from this information center, I said, pointing due west for him, and once you reach the large maple tree on the fork trail, turn to your right and you should reach the Willow campsite after about a mile's hike. The man looked down at me for a few moments, and after some sort of inner deliberation on his part, he stood up to his full height and began to walk off. After leaving the porch of the information center, he seemed to just meld into the inky black of night. This wasn't a surprise, as it was particularly dark that night and the light inside the information center would screw with my night vision, so I thought nothing of it at the time. The next hour or so came and went until it was time for me to do another round. I chose the West Quadrant this time, and before I hopped into my patrol car I did a little bit of inventory. I was supplied with a trank gun I thought I'd rarely need until my encounter with Derek, so this time I made sure I had darts and that my flashlight was topped up on batteries. After doing my quick inventory check and top up, I hopped into my patrol vehicle and rode off towards the West Quadrant. The West Quadrant patrol was a little more simple, if not more time consuming, than the East Quadrant. Most of the campsites in the park are located in the West Quadrant. My job in the East Quadrant was to make sure there were no stragglers in the dead of night on the trails, or that someone hadn't been attacked by a wild animal, or in need of some other kind of help. 
My job in the West Quadrant is to make sure campers are following safety protocols, no illegal hunting was being performed, and that all campers have extinguished their fires. I arrived at the first of the campsites, the Oak Campsite, and it was almost over full of tents and campers still sitting around their campfires, exchanging stories and drinks. I made a note to check in on them before I made my next round to make sure all was well and that they put out their fires before going to sleep. After that quick stop, I made my way to continue my round of the circuit, the next stop would be at the Willow Campsite. After a little over 15 minutes, I approached the Willow Campsite, I noticed that no noise could be heard. No sounds of laughter or campfire crackles, like the Oak Campsite. The Willow Campsite is not as popular as the Oak Campsite, because it's farther into the forest and further away from civilization, but this felt strange. Not even the crickets could be heard, which around here in the middle of the night was strange. Even the wind itself felt as though it dare not blow. I pulled the patrol vehicle to a stop a short way away from the Willow Campsite and began to walk in the direction of its clearing. I stopped dead in my tracks when I arrived, horrified at the sight. The campsite had been ripped apart from the look of things, campfires lay dying, turning to embers and ash with no one around to fuel them. Tents had their anchors ripped from the ground and tents lay strewn about or barely erect, torn open from the outside. There was no one left at the campsite. I closed my eyes and turned away, walling my fists at my sides in anger and frustration. They say people go missing in these places all the time, but I could hardly bear looking on at this sight. Just then, I felt something like a chill on the wind and yet no wind blew. A presence so unearthly I could feel it. Thank you, Ranger, came that same low voice with a slow speech. I have trouble remembering where I hunt sometimes. You brought me much food this night. My knees gave way and I collapsed to the ground. I felt like I was going to vomit, and I began to cry, not weeping tears, but tears of anger and sorrow. To have been fooled by this monster, I felt like this was all my fault. I glanced up at the creature and it stared back down at me, amber eyes glowing in the dim twilight. I notice now that the creature had antler or horn-like growths protruding from its head. Those amber eyes noticed that I had seen the creature, and you could almost feel the tension in the air as his expression went from amused to hatred. Pure, unbridled hatred. I scrambled up to my feet as quick as I quick, sprinting at full speed back towards the patrol vehicle, as I heard the creature crash through the forest after me. I made it to the back of the buggy before it had caught up to me and I grabbed the trank gun and brought it up to bear against the creature as it stopped in the headlights. I finally got a good look at him. He was tall, lanky, and had a human head and face, but the rest of him seemed to be devolved. Like the rest of his body didn't know he was human if that's what he even was. Slender body, but taut with muscle, like a wolf or cheetah. Long lanky arms that looked human, but had claws like a badger's. Legs like a deer or gazelle to hold this creature upright in a horrid hunchback way. Fur like a lion's mane but turned the color of mud. I was mortified of this creature but knew that if I didn't get a grip on myself, it would surely have me for dinner too. As it made a lunge around the patrol vehicle and began to charge me, I shot two darts as quickly as I could. It seems to hit something vital in him he fell mere feet before me. He still barreled into me as he tumbled head over toe, and took me with him off the side of the path. He made no move to attack me again, and I slid out from underneath him, careful of the antler-like crown of his head. I slid out from underneath the creature and sprinted off towards my vehicle again, leaving it there to hopefully never wake up. But I felt like I wouldn't be that lucky. I felt a little safer knowing the monstrosity was incapacitated for the time being, so I completed my circuit around the West Quadrant, only two more camps to go. As I checked in on the remaining campers for the night, I found nothing was amiss in their camps, and all were sleeping and occupied, still safely intact tents or makeshift shelters. As I left the final camp, I glanced over into the forest and for just a moment thought I spotted glowing amber-colored dots in the distance. As soon as I saw them, they disappeared. 
At the time I thought it was paranoia sinking in. After all, there's no way he should be able to move right now. So I dismissed it from my mind as I drove back to the information center. I got out the sheet of paper I had written rule 1 down on and went about making my amendments. Rule 2, if an overly tall man with amber eyes approaches the information center, do not give him the right directions. Rule 3, if you encounter the tall, malformed man with antlers outside of the information center, do not look at him at all. As I'm sure you can tell from the previous two stories, my working places can often get to be hectic and at times. Hell. Honestly, I started this list of rules as a reminder to myself and in the deluded hope that I could quit, leave it for the next poor sod to work this shift. Because it's time to come clean. The list of rules wasn't just out of the kindness of my heart, it was for two reasons. The first being to ground these events in reality, an ever-present reminder that these events took place and that I needed to be careful. The second reason being, an uncomfortable topic. You see, I don't like to talk about it that much, especially not with people I don't know very well. But for context, something isn't right with me, mentally speaking. I don't know if I have an unknown head injury that masquerades as a mental illness, or if it can even be considered such. But regardless of what it is or isn't, my memory is like a leaky plastic bag full of water. If I stop paying attention to it for long enough, it drains away, never to be recaptured. Even traumatic events such as these would eventually fade away into nothing but embers in the recesses of my mind until turning to ash. If I didn't create these rules, I'd end up in one of these traps again, and suffer all the same for them again. I don't make detailed descriptions in the rules on account of thinking the next ranger to take my place, when I sought to quit, wouldn't believe the accounts. So these rules were created, one piece at a time so that I could remind myself, and when I thought I could make it easier on the next guy. I even began keeping a journal after the events of this story, as I hear therapists and such recommended to begin coping or coming to terms with traumatic events. That's largely how I'm transcribing the story to you here. Bits of memory, faded at the edges like an old Polaroid photo, and the journal entries. Thankfully, the rest of my first night passed by largely uneventfully. I did my round of the southern quadrant of the park, with nothing worthy of note happening, bar the howling of a wolf in the far distance. There were no campsites out here and the trails didn't go far into the southern quadrant, so it was one of the more natural, untouched sections of the park. It also meant that my patrol was much simpler than the other two. The northern quadrant held a few campsites, but much less than the western quadrant. Not many people wanted to camp in the northern quadrant either, because all of the campsites were along the longer trails in the park. This also made the patrol much easier on me. However, I did say earlier that the night passed largely uneventfully. The only other weird thing that happened was the two sets of eyes I saw glimmering out of the forest at me as I neared the end of my patrol of the northern quadrant. One set was the color of amber, the other set was the color of crimson. Derek and Wendell. Yes, I named the tall, malformed man with the amber eyes Wendell. Yes, probably for the reasons you're thinking, given his appearance. But as soon as I registered that I had seen those two sets of eyes glimmering in the night shrouded forest, they were gone. I sped back to the information center fast as I dare to not incur the anger of anyone who may be camping nearby. I realize you may view this as cowardice, but I had checked all of the campsites in the northern quadrant and they were all vacant, and I had thought at the time that surely they wouldn't venture to the western quadrant together, right? After all, this was the only time I had seen them close to one another, surely they wouldn't encroach on each other's territory, right? I would later find out that my suspicions were correct, and that the northern quadrant was a sort of neutral ground between Wendell and Derek, and in certain circumstances, a cooperative hunting ground. I'm getting ahead of myself though, that's a story for later, as the last two patrols came and went, and the sun just began to peek over the horizon, another car showed up outside of the information center. It was the morning shift ranger, he had arrived 30 minutes early. 
I had to fight back the urge to rush out to meet him and ask him what in the actual hell was the deal with the creepy stuff going on last night, but it occurred to me that they were probably nocturnal hunters. I didn't even see Derek at all until 8 p.m. that night and though the trail cams never picked up his movements. I had a hunch. That hunch was confirmed when, after some idle small talk, I instead asked the morning shift ranger about disappearances in the park, specifically about rangers. Disappearances in general were common, chalked up to camping etiquette failures as he put it, and bodies, or what were left of them, were often found. More often than not though, searches were conducted, and called off when heads nor tails could be found of the missing person. But disappearances of rangers? It only ever happened to night shift rangers, except in rare and unusual circumstances. Typical animal attack or wild men, as some theorize, he said in response. The remaining 30 minutes passed by as the morning shift ranger made some coffee and got some gear, paper, and a book ready for his shift. I told him to have a good day, and took my leave of that godawful place, making my way quickly to my car. I made the drive home without a hitch, made it my upstairs bedroom in my house, and passed out for a time. Once I woke up, I checked the time and the beginning trickle of dread began to invade my mind, I only had a few hours before I had to go back to work. Even equipped with the rules and knowledge from the night before, my chest started to tighten at the thought of going back, and it became hard to breathe. The beginning signs of a panic attack for me. I called the information center and requested they call another ranger to fill my spot for the night, with the excuse that I must have caught something or had food poisoning. The ranger who was there didn't seem all that surprised by the regular night shift ranger calling out on his second day. He said that these things happened and he'd get the spot filled for the night, and bid me to get well soon. I thanked him for understanding, and hung up, deciding to catch a few more hours of shut eye once I'd calmed down. I got a glass of water, watched some videos to distract myself from the sense of dread, and before I knew it, I had passed out. Ran, Gare. I heard a voice, speaking softly, with a bit of a growl behind it. I'm going. To find you. Ranger. Two beads of crimson blinked into existence inches away from my face in the darkness. I woke up in a cold sweat, remembering only that portion of the nightmare I obviously had. Those two beady, crimson eyes. The rasping voice and broken speech pattern. Derek haunts me even in my dreams, I had thought. Even when I can't see him, even when he's not around, he's still just screwing with me. I needed another glass of water, and maybe a beer. I trudged my way downstairs, and noticed a soft noise from coming from. Somewhere. It was faint, but noticeable. A noise like a dog scratching at a door it wants into, but not rapid like a dog would. Slow, methodical. Rake. Rake. As I arrived downstairs, the scratching noise had started to come less often, and more quietly. I paid it no mind as I walked into my kitchen and grabbed a water bottle and a beer. As I turned towards my back door though, I could see it, blending in the faint light that shined from the refrigerator. Twin beads of crimson, peering in through the window next to my back door. I froze in shock, mouth agape in terror as I realized, Derek was outside my back door. I could see the faint outline of his face in the low light his too many teeth jutting his cheeks out unnaturally, and his lips curled into a facsimile of a smile. I could hear glass shatter as I had lost my grip on the bottle of beer in my hands, and the soft boing noise of the plastic water bottle bouncing off the ground. My body had begun to tremble as I caught sight of Derek. After I thought I'd have a normal night, he just couldn't leave me be. At work, in my sleep, and now even at my own home this specter of death haunted me. I knew I wouldn't be safe if I let him out of my sight though, that much rang true in my mind. I had to think of a plan, or I would die in my own home. I don't think I'll get lucky enough against him a second time, not caught off guard like this. I backed up and searched the wall for a light switch, not daring to turn away from that hideous visage. After many moments of patting the wall and finding nothing, my palm finally fell on the switch and I flipped it on. 
I got a better look at Derek now, and noticed his arms were frozen in place in unnatural ways, like his elbows and shoulders worked differently from a normal person's, they bulged against the skin, threatening to break the surface at any moment. That must be what the popping of bones was when I first encountered him, he had been getting in position to maul me. I checked the time that displayed digitally on the microwave quickly, it read 3.05 am. I had to keep him occupied until daytime, when I expected him to grow weary and return to his infernal den. Wait! 3.05 am? Had I slept that long from what I called out? 11 extra hours? How could that be? The glance at the microwave and the ensuing confused thoughts evidently bought Derek enough time to slink back into the shadow of night, because when I glanced back he wasn't at my back door anymore. Terror sunk in as I realized he could be anywhere outside, or inside? No. Everything was locked, no glass had shattered since the dropped beer bottle, so he couldn't have made his way inside without me knowing. I had to calm down and think of a plan. A flash of an amber glow in my backyard caught my attention. Of course Wendell was here too. This complicated things even further, because I knew I shouldn't be caught staring at Wendell, and I knew I couldn't look away from Derek. And now they could be anywhere outside. I had to think of a plan swiftly otherwise I'd be dead whenever they decided to strike. Could I hide? No they'd find a way in and then I'm as good as worm food. Could I fight? I knew Wendell could be tranquilized but I had no idea if he could be hurt enough to fend off before he broke through my defense and took me out, and that isn't counting on the fact that a tag team with Derek would be nearly impossible to fend off. Could I run? If I could make it to my car I could drive. I knew Derek was fast, faster than Wendell, but could he keep up with a car? It seemed like my only option. I grabbed my car keys off of the table in the living room and waited for a time to make my escape. I couldn't see either of them out front of my house, but I knew if I didn't make my move soon they'd find another route of entry and get to me, and I'd be as good as dead. I waited just a few more minutes for any signs of them, and when I was sufficiently satisfied they must be around a different part of the house, I opened my front door and closed it shut behind me, and as a reflex I locked the door too. Emotion and sentiment ingrained into my since I got my first key to a house from my parents when I was a kid. Always lock the door behind you. I heard rustling as I had finished locking the door and stared at the tree line next to my house, but saw nothing. I did one more scan of the surrounding area before making a mad dash to the car, unlocking it from the fob as I sprinted over and grasped the door handle. As soon as my hand made contact I was hit hard from the side and something razor sharp slashed my arm in multiple places. I groaned loudly in pain, holding back a scream as I looked at my assailant, and of course found none other than Derek. I had my gaze firmly planted on him now, so he couldn't make any more moves, but he had that horrible tooth-filled grin plastered on his face again. That same horrible laughing noise he makes came again as I backed away, planning on moving around the car to the other side, so I could climb over the console and into the driver's side, never breaking eye contact. My plan halted when I backed into something. I heard labored breathing and felt the warmth of fur touching my neck. It was Wendell. This was their trap. The figure of Wendell loomed over me and it took every fiber of my being not to blink or look away from Derek, or look at Wendell. My options were growing smaller by the millisecond, I'd either blink or Wendell would make me look at him and then I'd be dead. I gripped the car keys in my hand and prepared for something really stupid. I dove over the trunk of my rear window, using all of my remaining strength on the car key as I jammed it into the window, it worked, shattering the glass into tiny fragments. I kept my gaze fixed on Derek through the door windows of my car as I clambered inside through the broken window, suffering multiple small cuts, and shards of glass stuck themselves into my arms as I crawled. I crawled my way over the console and into the driver's side door, blocking the door, and trying to fumble the key into the ignition. I caved, looking at the ignition in desperation to get away, finally slotting the key into place and turning it over. The car roared to life, 
And just as it did a clawed hand burst through the driver's side window and slashed my shoulder as it tried to get a grip on me, instead the clawed hand grasped my shirt it had just torn to ribbons. The torn part of the shirt came away as I slammed the transmission into reverse and hit the gas. As I whipped the car away I hit something, hard. Wendell was knocked away from the rear of the car as I had essentially just hit him with my car. This had almost definitely put a dent into my trunk, but also gave me an idea. I stared straight ahead at Derek, who froze in flasks as the headlights shined on him. I slammed the car into drive and floored it into Derek, sending him sprawling onto his back as I swung the car hard to the right, running Derek over and peeling out across the grass of my yard into the road. This had definitely put a sizable dent into the front of my car, but I didn't care. Cut, bruised, and battered as I was I had survived. Now I only had to shake them until sunrise. Surprisingly enough, it wasn't that hard. I just drove around town for the next few hours until sunrise, not bothering to stop for red lights, but that luckily wasn't much of a problem, as I encountered no cops, and no other cars on the road. I thanked whatever cosmic force was watching over me at that moment, and continued to drive. After the sun had begun to peek over the horizon once again, I made my way to the hospital. I actually wasn't supposed to work the next day or the day after, so I was fine when the doctors told me I'd have to spend a few nights there with them, and grimaced when I learned I'd need more than a few stitches. But I had survived both of them, and they hadn't bothered me at the hospital at all. On the days I wasn't supposed to work. Once I had been released from the hospital and was all patched up, I spent the rest of my days off unaccosted. This lead me to the realization of Rule 4, and Rule 5 was an unofficial one that I only keep in my notebook. Rule 4, under no circumstances should you ever call out of work. Rule 5, if you encounter both the man with the sharp teeth and the tall, malformed man, run. There is no other way to survive. Run and pray you make it to safety. Not a park ranger, but my inexplicable story is probably explicable, but I've never found out the answer and I've asked. I was camping in a campground on the west coast. I have back problems, so when I camp I sleep in the car. I had the back seat converted to a bench seat and put my sleeping bag there. I cover the car windows for privacy. Early one morning I hear this rumbling sound. It's loud enough to wake me up. I'm a child of the suburbs and what it really sounds like is when you push a shopping cart across a really rough parking lot, one with a lot of gravel sticking out of the concrete. Then the car gets bumped, hard. The whole car moved. I immediately start unzipping the sleeping bag with the inside zipper, but that's not the quickest process. By the time I get free enough to sit up and look there's nothing there. But some big animal had walked by and I love to know what makes a rumbling noise like that. I lived on the outskirts of a national park in a cabin. It was a four mile drive from the main road just to get to the property, and we had no plumbing or power. This property was right next to where the park started, to call it the middle of nowhere is an understatement. My roommate at the time was interning with the park service, but he is a city kid. Every evening at the dead of night I had been hearing noises in the woods, what I thought was someone walking. But then they just stop in particularly overgrown areas of the jungle, so your mind starts to doubt itself. Is it a pig? A cat? Is it just the wind? The cabin didn't have a locking door and the owners didn't want me to install one, so I began sleeping in my car. Now, this is a huge property, and I'd park my car over an acre away from the cabin and where I was hearing something. I started hearing those footsteps again. I moved out, my roommate, who thought I was bonkers, stayed and still slept there without a locking door. He got robbed, not once, but twice after I moved out. So he finally put up motion triggered cameras. There was a man with a long rifle who'd hike up to the property, set up in the bushes, and watch us.
Back in 2010 I had just finished a wilderness leadership class and decided to go to Colorado to get some solo wilderness time. I found out about some hot springs near the Colorado River that were only accessible during the winter, during the summer the snow melt raises the water level of the river and they become submerged, and decided to go spend a few weeks out there. It was on BLM land and I had about a 4 mile hike from where I parked to where I was camping. The BLM lady who watched the land saw me when I arrived and asked me to just write the date on my windshield every week to let her know I'm still alive out there. Anyways, it was pretty pleasant out there, but every night I was terrified of the bears, they should be sleeping, but if they aren't it means they are hungry and I'm for dinner. For this reason I decided to set up camp close to a cliff. It was about 40 down to the river and I figured, worst case scenario I could jump and then get to the hot springs to prevent hyperthermia. It's a crazy plan, but once you're out there you realize bear spray is kinda useless inside the tent. So one early morning I hear these loud animal noises outside my tent. They are getting closer and very loud, accompanied by grunting and breathing noises. I was too scared to open my tent, I just froze. And the steps kept getting closer and closer and closer. At this point I could hear it sniffing my tent. I don't dare move, I just lay there. It starts to move away from my tent but it's still out there, and now I hear more than one animal. I finally poke my head out, and it's a herd of elk. I swear though. It was probably the most scared I've ever been out camping. I used to be in a group that's somewhat like the scouts so we spent a lot of time in the woods and some weird thing happened often but most of the time it was easy to explain. One thing happened though that to this day scares the living s out of me. I was a leader for the age group 8 to 10 years old and we were out on a camping trip. It was the first year we stayed on that terrain and it was huge, Normally we tend to explore the majority of a terrain before the kids arrive so we were aware of any possible dangerous spots to avoid. This time it was impossible. Every camp we have what we call a night game, it's usually a scary game in which the kids have to complete several tasks while the leaders scare the ever-loving s out of them. Obviously we had one two during that camp, we masked up as monsters and hid out in the woods close to the checkpoints they had to pass. While running in between checkpoints I found an open stretch of forest with little to no foliage so it was ideal for chasing after them. There was no real room to hide besides behind trees so I couldn't use my flashlight or they'd be able to see me from miles away. It was dark, like the unsettling kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes and you start imagining things that aren't real. During my stay there I saw a shadow that was around my size running past me a few times, I couldn't see it very well so I just assumed I was imagining things because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. The game was nearing its end and I saw the shadow again, this time I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it was one of the other leaders hiding to scare kids and decided to go over there as it was about time to go back. I aimed my flashlight towards the tree and while getting closer I noticed that there was indeed someone standing there dressed in what looked like a torn burlap sack and had their head covered with a few white plastic bags that looked like they were tied together. I started to feel pure dread, something felt really off. I asked if everything was okay but they didn't respond. The only thing I heard was this weird sound that sounded like someone knocking on wood. Nevertheless I went a bit closer until I was about 10 meters away from this person. The knocking sound turned out to be that person smacking his head repeatedly into the tree and I noticed he looked like a male. He was barefoot and his arms and legs were covered with crusted mud, his hands were in a weird cramped position. I was convinced this was just one of the other leaders pulling a prank so I told them to knock it off. He slowly turned his head and started walking towards me. Something inside me just told me to run, it didn't matter if it was a just a stupid prank and I ran away scared for nothing. If this wasn't a prank it felt like I was in serious danger so I ran as fast as I could. I heard him running after me but I didn't want to turn around to look as I'd probably run into a tree. 
I arrived back at the campsite and every single person that could be dressed like that was already there, they couldn't have gotten there before me and if they did they sure as hell didn't have the time to change into their regular clothes. Still, I told them and that they gave me a good scare with that. They just looked weird at me, thinking I was trying to scare them and we left it at that. Next day I wanted to go check it out, who knows maybe some weirdo ate the wrong mushroom and might be out there dying from hypothermia. I took someone else with me just in case and there was nothing but endless trees. We arrived at the tree where I saw the person banging his head and there was a dead, skinned, decomposing rabbit nailed to the tree. We called the cops, they looked around quickly and brushed it off as just a prank from another scouting group or some kids from the nearby town and left it at that. We didn't notice anything weird after that so it probably was a dumb prank, but seriously some people have a sick up sense of humor. Not a ranger but I was out camping with my dog one night in and along the Mogollon Rim of Arizona. It was dark and we were sitting around the campfire when we hear something behind a bush close to our camp. Instead of my dog barking at it, he begins to whimper. I didn't think nothing of it and just tended to the fire. After a couple of minutes we were some more noises from a different bush. This time my dog gets up and goes over to the tent and scratches the door because he wants to go in. I toss a couple of rocks in the direction I heard the noise and nothing happened. I'm spooked now so I toss a couple of pieces of wood on the fire and climb into my tent with my dog hoping that the light from the fire would keep whatever was out there away. We eventually fall asleep and luckily had no other disturbances during the night. The next morning, I go out behind the bushes where we had heard the noises and found mountain lion tracks that were circling around our camp. I'm sure glad I didn't go looking at night when I heard the noises. When I went backpacking at Philmont, Boy Scout Place, every crew started out with a ranger that went out with the crew for the first couple of days just to make sure that they were going to be okay and had the necessary skills to get to their destinations. After they left the crews they would head to the nearest staff camp or pickup location. Our ranger was telling us about one of his hikes back after leaving a crew. He followed along a game trail since they are usually easy ways to get through the woods and as he was walking a mountain lion walked up behind him and then scented him like a house cat does by rubbing against your legs. When a mountain lion does that apparently you involuntarily defecate and urinate in your pants and then hope to god the lion was just in a playful mood. As it turned out this one was indeed just screwing with him and he made it safely back to camp. I was the lone recreation ranger in a small district in southern Idaho. Nearest town from guard station was about an 1.5 hours away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power was not working, and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors, bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night. The woods there always had an eerie feeling to them, unlike the southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the seasonal job, I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. Now this district was known for its badgers and beavers, so I didn't think much of it. When leaving the cabin at night, I always had an eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night, I was returning from my grocery run, always went on Tuesday nights, and I had a bad feeling. At the time, I did not have my shotgun in the vehicle. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes about 3.5 to 4 feet in the air. To say I freaked out was an understatement. I started yelling get out of here but the eyes only crouched down, and inched closer. At this point I could tell it was a large animal of some kind, definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area and the creature leapt back a bit but did not make a sound. Tossed four or five more pieces and creature still inched forward. At this point I fumbled with the keys, 
Of course the solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and grabbed my shotgun, technically, you are not supposed to have guns in gov housing, but who lives in the hills have eyes back country and does not carry. Went outside, creature was bit closer. Still could not get a good look with my bad headlamp. Loaded shotgun and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, trail crew came up and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch, rocking bench, and compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move and someone or something walking on the porch, but never found any tracks after that point. Considering that it was always muddy up there it was weird to not find any tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before and never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. I was in the Gila wilderness and a convoy of us campers slash fishers were making the drive on the dirt road from Mogalone to Snow Lake when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over looking in a ditch. Turns out some idiot tried to make a U-turn and didn't realize the loose rock makes it hard to stop, they went over the edge and high centered. We're miles from the nearest official campground and it's early spring and the night time gets pretty damn cold. We get a jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. Off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, fanny pack and the purple velvet sweatsuit, that's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny. He comes up to us and he tells us he's German and having a great time. We could not get over the purple velvet suit, it was like a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious, wants to know where he's staying and where he came from. It was around 9 o'clock in the morning and the only way he could have gotten where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guys is a goofy and just points off toward the other mountain when asked where he's staying slash going. We all think it's funny, but also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food. The sun is intense above 5000 feet even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help and just crosses the road goes off into the woods. The ranger told us he can't really keep the guy from doing that since he seemed okay. He said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he made it. We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to better catch fish. That evening the ranger pops by to tell us that nobody at any other camp had seen the dude. He radioed around and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in purple pimp sweatsuit. That range rolled off duty the next day and his replacement came by to make sure the other ranger was smoking something we gave him. We assured him it all happened. Never heard another word about the German in the purple pimp sweatsuit, but makes for a good story. German tourists are different. I was doing some stuff in Death Valley NP a couple of summers ago and left via the opposite direction of the construction crew. So this is a second hand story, as we were all leaving after a very long night of pouring concrete. They should have been done at around sunrise, but things didn't finish up until like 1 pm or so. The archaeologist, let's call him Art, saw a faint glimmer of silver in a bush. Thinking that it was an old balloon, a huge problem. Don't release balloons, they always come down somewhere and end up as litter, he turned around to retrieve it. Instead he found a German man sitting there under car windshield sunscreen thing with a piece of rolling luggage by his side. This was an area that was closed off to the public until the road was repaired and nobody would be back through until the next day, so he stopped to talk to the man. Apparently, the German man, Claus is a good German name, let's use that had been dropped off by his wife and mother-in-law the afternoon before and was in the middle of a long hike, like 20 to 30 miles or so. He had been hiking all night and was taking a break to rest during the day. There were plans to meet up in a day or two, but the women were in Vegas at the casinos. 
After some discussion, Art learned that Claus had no food or supplies and had only drank a few sips from one of his three half-liter water bottles since he began the trek, he thought rationing it would be best since he only had a small amount of water. The temperature was already in the 120F range and Art had to explain that the guy could not stay there, or he would very literally die. Claus said that he would be fine because he trained by sitting in a sauna a number of times before he left Germany, plus, how would his wife know where to pick him up if they left? After explaining the difference between sitting in a sauna and hiking with no food in a dry desert, Art proceeded to question what would happen if his wife's car broke down or if she got delayed for some reason. There is no phone service in that part of the park and nobody was supposed to be in the area to begin with, so Claus would be Saul if his wife didn't arrive. Claus finally agreed to jump into Art's truck and drive to the nearby town greater than 20 miles away. As soon as he got into the AC of the truck and took a few sips of cool water, Claus realized how hot his body actually was and that he was actually in pretty bad shape. When they got to the town they actually Claus' wife and mother-in-law in the parking lot of the only gas station. It turns out that they had broken down there and never made it to Vegas. After talking a little, Art had to get off to sleep, he had been up all night, and reminded Claus to grab his roller suitcase from the back of the truck. Art casually asked what was inside and Claus opened it to reveal a suitcase full of water bottles. Claus was so delirious from heat that he forgot the heavy bag that he had somehow been rolling across the desert was full of water. Delirium like that is a sign of sunstroke, Claus probably wouldn't have made it through the rest of the day had Art not insisted on him getting into the truck. This was around 2015 when I went on a day hike at a Mount GB, somewhere in the southern part of Luzon area. The week prior to my hike, I was in the same area with a friend. Being that the trail is relatively straightforward, we decided not to hire a guide. Fast forward to the present, I decided to do a nighttime trek with five of my colleagues in tow. Since I was the one who knew the trail, I was the group leader. About an hour or so, we heard something that went, PSSST, 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 as we were hiking the trail. We looked around, thinking it might be one of the locals, some parts of the trail led to small houses. Anyway, it soon stopped, so we forgot all about it. We soon reached a narrow part of the trail bordered by shallow cliffs on either side. Since I was the lead, I was very focused on the trail and I didn't notice that my colleagues were lagging behind until one of them said, Hey, why don't you shine your flashlight right in front of you? I stopped walking and waited for them to catch up. When we reached the campsite, I asked my colleague why he told me to shine the flashlight right in front of myself. Well, he whispered, you were walking so fast I didn't think you saw the child standing right in front of you. Me and my two other friends were walking on our way home from the summit of a Mount B, also in southern Luzon, when a kid came to us asking if he can guide us for five paces only. He was dressed with a blue checkered shirt and a white pants. He was very well groomed, his clothes were wrinkle free and his hair wasn't even messy at all. We knew the trail by heart, so we kept on declining his offer. Eventually we agreed, since we figured he would follow us anyway. When we started to walk again he suddenly stopped following us. I called out to him, but he didn't mind me. He just stood still. I looked at my companions and they were very scared. So I said, okay, stay there if you want, but you won't get your five pesos. And left. Now I told this story to fellow mountaineers and they told me the kid was probably a child of one of the guides. This is a very popular urban legend surrounding a certain Mount C, also called the Devil's Mountain. The famous legend narrates the story of a couple who went on a hike in Mount C at midnight. They got lost when they accidentally took an unusual trail on their way to campsite. Even if the weather is threatening because of a storm and there was zero visibility, they still continued their hike. They arrived in a point where the trail forked and they turned left when they should have turned right. 
the left was a deadly trail, thus they never made it to campsite. According to local folks, the two were not found until now. This story is connected to the previous one, also taking place in Mount C. A group of hikers, together with a guide, went on a rarely used trail. On the way they passed by a small village, where the elders advised them to continue the trek but leave the only girl in the group at the village. They politely declined and continued hiking. Halfway through, the guide told them that he could only go as far as the first half. Being experienced hikers, they paid the guide and continued until they came to a fork in the road. As they were debating which road to take, a couple stumbled upon them and told them to take the left side. They continued following the couple even as it got dark and started to rain. Suddenly, their flashlights turned off simultaneously, but they still tried to follow the couple. When the rain stopped and their flashlights came back on, the couple was gone, and one of the group members slipped and almost fell from a ravine. Not a ranger but my uncle was. He always told the story of when he worked in Montana he was a solid 5 to 10 miles away from town so pretty much balls deep in the woods. He recalled pulling his ATV on top of a semi-big hill that overlooked a valley, in between all the trees there was this clearing he could see through his binoculars, through them he saw an older lady, 60 plus ish, in black surrounded by a 6 to 8 wolves. Now. He is a lengthy distance from the woman but he starts yelling and honking and all that and takes off down the hill as fast as he could but when he reached the clearing there was no one there. No wolves, no woman, only a silver ring with a black stone in the middle. He still has it to this day. I have been a ranger in the USFS for almost 15 years, but this takes place about 3 years after I joined. We were getting calls about a lone wolf with a collar on hanging around campsites weird, since wolves aren't known to be in the area, but when you work in the field long enough you start to realize anything is possible. No calls had mentioned violent behavior from the animal, thank God. I departed from the station around noon to check out the places that it had been sighted. Wandered around for about three hours, no further calls during that time, until I took a break for water. Sat down, had a snack, drank some water and was getting ready to go again when the thing was about 20 feet out, trotting near the tree line. It seemed friendly and had the collar, so I whistled to it and he came over to me. Getting a closer look, I could see it wasn't a wolf. It was huge, but it was dark and didn't have the right body structure, though I could see why it'd be confusing from a distance. I radioed in and reported that I had the dog with me, but as soon as I said I'd bring it in, the dog took off. Like he was playing, to see how far he could get me to chase him, typical dog behavior, I went after it, and I swear it was a game of chase for at least 5 minutes as we steadily ran through the forest. Please don't go running through woods unless you know the area like the back of your hand, the dog finally slowed down near a rock bed slash creek area, and started pacing around a spot. I drew closer and didn't see anything off at first, then I noticed it, the overgrowth had almost disguised what appeared to be bones. I called it in immediately, and another team was sent to recover the remains. When I went to retrieve the dog, he was just gone. But, honestly, it wasn't a priority at that point. He was friendly enough, and I figured we'd catch up with him later. The bones were identified as a teenage male's died by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He'd been reported missing in the area long before I became a ranger, and there'd been pretty much no hope of finding him. I spoke to his mom on the phone, she called to thank me personally, and she asked how I'd found her son. I mentioned the black dog, then thought I'd said something wrong since there was a pause on her side of the line. After I gave a couple details about the dog, she quietly explained that her son, who struggled with making connections, had sunken into a deep depression after the death of his best friend, the very dog that led me to him. I think I spent the rest of the day stunned. I continue to be in disbelief, in a way. But I know what happened.
Back in the early 90s my brothers and I were staying with my cousin and her husband, who I'll call Scott, who was a DNR officer. This was opening day of deer, bow, season in northern Michigan. While I was at least a mile from any road or trail I stumbled across an area that looked like people had been camping recently, they'd even built this weird outdoor kitchen. Being a naive 16 to 17 year old the kitchen confused me but I figured they had left because hunting season had started so I just continued on my way. That night I was telling everyone about it when Scott gets serious and asked me about what it looked like and where it was. After I told him he warned me not to go back there and to be glad no one was there. Apparently some locals had multiple locations like that where they would cook meth so they wouldn't blow up their houses and to make it harder to get caught. I guess Scott reported it to the cops and they raided it a couple days later. I must have missed it, but the guys had set up multiple trail cams, which were damn expensive at that time, all around the area. Based on the pics on them, I missed the guys by a few hours. They were heavily armed while I only had a bow and a knife. On the surface it seems like a well thought out plan from some smart people, but they weren't very smart after all. Scott filled us in later on some details. Apparently they didn't clear the images off the cameras before leaving. The images, though too low of a resolution to recognize their faces, showed them not only cooking the meth, but also carrying illegal guns and riding off on customized four-wheelers known to everyone in the area. They ended up getting 20 years in prison. I have a friend who is a trail ranger, basically a ranger who can't get you in trouble. He told me about this time he was gathering illegally placed wildlife cameras and knocking down hunting stands, feeders, and blinds with another actual ranger. The other ranger wasn't feeling well so he said he was going to head back as it's a one-hour ATV ride. Friend finished up the last one when he heard voices. Keep in mind he's far off the beaten path. He called out and no one replied. As it was getting dark he started to head back and found that his ATV wouldn't start. He then noticed that the battery was not connected anymore. He reconnected it and started to drive but it wasn't going fast at all. Less than a half mile later the whole thing died. He radioed back basically saying hey guys, I need someone to come pick me up. They told him they would but it would be an hour. He asked if the other guy got back and they said no. He settled down and started a small fire but before long he heard voices again. It's dark. He's not happy. The voices sound like an argument now. Someone was angry and yelling at someone else who sounded more scared. He called out and asked if anyone needed help. The voices didn't seem to care. He guessed they had to be less than a 1000 feet away. He radioed again and they said they were having trouble finding what path he might be on and haven't left yet. He asked them just to get the other ranger to tell them about where they are because he left with the iPad, that had the map. They said he still isn't back. About three more minutes go by and he hears the voices start up again. He decides to walk to them hoping maybe they can stop being drunk assholes and maybe have a map. He walked in their direction but the voices seemed to be getting further as he got closer. Finally after 20 minutes he gave up and walked back. He got a radio call and they said the other guy was found passed out covered in vomit and was being taken to the hospital but he crossed off everywhere they found a stand so they have a general idea where he is. Then the radio died. Then the voices came back. Bored out of his mind he decided to listen to what they were arguing about picking up things like well it wasn't yours to take I don't care you knew better and so on. His guess was two hunters arguing over a kill. Then he heard the one shout something intelligible, then silence, the, uh, bang. A gunshot. He doused his fire and hid. After that he heard nothing. Just his breathing for the next half hour until he saw ATV lights. He told the guy picking him up everything and they called back. They had people looking for three hours and found nothing. They came back the next day with police and dogs. After about an hour a shallow grave was found and in it was a long dead man who had clearly been shot in the face. Thing was, it was a skeleton who was there for years. 
So either the argument he heard just ended with a bang and both parties went home last night, or he heard the murder of someone from years ago. Small chance I'm the cause of one ranger's story from about a decade or so ago. I was hunting public land with my dad, several miles from anything close to a trail. So the day goes by and not much is going on, weather is bad and I'm not hearing distant gunshots, so I reckon the deer aren't moving much. I radio to the old man that I'm gonna head back, and we make plans to rendezvous where we had split up that morning. Twenty or so minutes later, I was kneeling around the edge of a pond, stripping off all my bulky camo layers. I was just messing around, putting stuff in my bag while I listened to my earphones. I can't remember if I had taken my blaze orange hat off or not to remove my pullover, but I had all the appropriate gear to denote myself as a hunter in my possession. As I was digging through my bag I thought I heard that faint bass of someone yelling, so I took an earbud out and noticed that crouched on the opposite edge of the pond, there was a lone forest ranger kinda just watching me. I stood up, but didn't wave, and I wasn't sure he had even yelled to me in the first place so I didn't holler anything to him. We just kinda locked eyes for what felt like a few minutes. To be clear, we weren't doing anything illegal, my rifle was unloaded by that point, though slung over my shoulder, obscuring the fact the action was open and were following all laws and regulations. I hunched back over to my bag, pulled out my walkie and radioed to my dad we've got company. My motives weren't nefarious, I just didn't want my dad to come bumbling down the hill and be surprised by a friendly law enforcement officer. When I looked back up, maybe 15 seconds later, that ranger was gone. I mean flat out gone. So eventually I meet back up with my dad and start to tell him about what happened. Yeah, as deep back in here as we are, he probably thought we were up to no good, and hit the trail when he saw you on a radio. They get ambushed like that. As someone who gets nervous, anxious, around cops, it never occurred to me that I could be causing similar anxiety in them. If you're reading this DNR bro, I'd like to offer you a heartfelt my bad, and keep up the good work. My grandpa had a hunting buddy in the 70s who was basically a hermit in the woods of the Pacific Northwest. He was staying with him in his cabin deep in the Cascade Mountains during a hunting trip. No running water, no electricity. Miles away from the nearest town or paved road. His cabin was built on stilts and on an incline. It had a 10 feet balcony from the base of the bottom of the stilts with no stairs or ladder to climb up on. My grandpa claims that he knew this man for a long time and said that he didn't have the personality to lie. I've also known my grandpa to never be one for BS. One night during the trip, they were relaxing at the cabin after a hunt, and his buddy tells him that Sasquatch is in the area and to be careful going out at night. Thinking he was pulling his leg, my grandpa chuckled and didn't think much about it. His friend then put on a very serious face and grabbed a few pieces of fruit, bread, and jerky and placed them in a bowl. He took the bowl out onto the balcony and set it on the edge and said it'll be empty in the morning, and then went to bed. It was an open floor single room cabin, about 300 square feet my grandpa had a cot set up near the balcony window and was woken up in the middle of the night by rustling outside. He peeked through the window and saw the bowl, empty, and to this day still claims he saw four fingers resting on the edge of the balcony just before letting go. He never went hunting in that area again. When I was a kid in the Colorado Rockies, I was taking my horse and the whole band of dogs we had, two labs, an Aussie and a Dachshund, to our pond by my grandparents' place. I decided it was a great idea to venture the back way through the thicker part of the pine forest. I knew the way and so did the animals, horse included. About five minutes from the house, I was oblivious to the world and didn't notice that the dogs were no longer with me. When I finally decided to come back to the real world and notice the missing dogs, 
I turned back since you don't go anywhere without them. They were basically my guardians and supervisors up there. I get about halfway back to the house, come up a small gully heavily filled with pines and there is this huge Tom, cougar, just staring at me, right in the path. I made at the time, a little guy and a tasty morsel for this animal. Luckily, I had the horse, who upon seeing the animal immediately bolted directly back to the pasture. The cat seemed to run after us, didn't really watch. We roll up into the drive, head towards the pasture and I agree that this ends my adventures for the day. After I put the horse up, the dogs find me again and we are walking back to the house when they get real jumpy and timid. I stop and begin to look around. There is a large and old pine splitting the distance between the pasture and the house and on the lowest branch, I see the damn Tom again. Luckily, the presence of the dogs deterred any action, but I made it a point to pass far away from the tree, and as calmly as I can I tell my grandpa what happened. He goes outside, rifle in hand and never found the bastard. To this day, I never venture out without a dog or a weapon, just in case. I've had some weird stuff happen but I'm probably the cause of a lot more unexplained sightings. I used to spend a lot of time in the forest near my neighborhood, it's a small strip of trees that's biggest inhabitant is a fox. I got into vulture culture slash taxidermy about a year ago, I've always been a fan of zoology and being able to look at animals in a different way is incredibly interesting. When I was getting into it the fox in the forest had just had kits and was hunting over time to feed them. I started kind of an exchange where I'd pick up bones and such from around the den and if I found fresh corpses elsewhere I'd leave the meat around the den instead of wasting it. Unfortunately this garnered me the reputation of outcast slash horrible dead animal lady from most of the kids who liked to play in the forest and noticed me carrying bags of rotting animal parts around. As far as I'm aware none of them actually knew anything about me aside from the rotting meat and the time I accidentally busted through with a bunch of live snakes. So that should pretty well cement their opinion on me. We were camping along the Sunshine Coast in Lower Mainland British Columbia. It was the off-season so not too many campers in the area and we were in some beautiful land, lush jungle-like forested areas right beside the ocean. 5 a.m. in the morning, right before dusk, right behind our tent, we were camping by literally no other people, I hear. Hooey! Hooey! As loud as can be. I woke up real quick and asked my husband if he heard that and what he thought that was. He says, do you want me to be honest with you? A uh, yes? I think it was a Sasquatch, and I'm like no way, Therese just no way. I started thinking about all the animals in the area and different calls they would make and I'm a pretty avid camper and live in the country, so I do recognize calls of different animals. Cougar? Bear? No, nope. All? Nope. I didn't go to sleep and kept the knife in my hand for another hour before the sun came up, while I was on my phone googling what Sasquatch sounds like. I know there's a ton of conspiracy around this but we did find a recording of a supposed Sasquatch that sounded similar to what we heard. Can't find it now, I'll keep looking. We went into town later that day and told a local and he's like yeah, lots of sightings around here. The natives even have totems dedicated to them. I work at a summer camp taking kids on canoe trios for a few days at national parks. One night after setting up campsite and quenching the fire I was doing last check of the campsite. I looked at the lake and saw this lone man paddling a canoe. I thought it was pretty strange but it's not out of the ordinary, the only weird thing being that he was alone. He waved so being the polite Canadian I am I waved back. Went to bed in the staff tent and everything was normal. I had a bit of trouble sleeping that night so I decided to go stargazing as that usually calms me down. I exit the tent and see this man on our campsite, looking through our tarps and bags. For what I don't know, maybe drugs or food but that's not important. 
This stranger is by the campers I am responsible for. We make eye contact and this guy stands up. He is tall as all hell and I am quite short so I quickly grab the first thing I can think of. A can of bear mace. This stuff is meant to like kill a charging bear so I hold it ready to spray and tell him to GTFO of my campsite. We doesn't really speak just like oh, I, didn't, see, you, guys. When he is leaving I immediately wake up the other staff and we make sure he leaves. We use our SAT phone to call park rangers with our position, the guy's characteristics and tell them the story. Without a doubt the scariest moment I had won the job. I've learned not to fear animals, as for the most part they are predictable dumb and not malicious. But people on the other hand. The scariest and most dangerous thing to encounter out in the wilderness is a person. So my dad is a forestry technician and this happened to one of his co-workers. They were up doing some sort of job in the very most northerly part of Ontario. Anyways it was in the middle of the night and she was half asleep and vaguely heard something outside her tent. Then she felt something push against her tent and the zipper slowly open. She opened her eyes and saw the head of a polar bear in her tent. Polar bears are far from the cuddly toys that you see and they are known to be super aggressive and will hunt and eat people. She laid there paralyzed with fear thinking that it was the end and then slowly the bear retracted its head and left. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.